Good afternoon, everybody. At least good afternoon in the Netherlands. In some of your countries, it might be uh, late in the evening or even early in the morning. And uh, I really like to welcome you to this uh, first European Energy Storage System Safety Conference. And this is the first first year, first event that we uh, we organized from uh, from Europe. Uh, in the in the preparations for this uh, this conference, we we did a great job with our, our colleague from the United States, in particular uh, Matthew Pace, and from the Netherlands, we had two uh, great contributions to the preparations, which were made by uh, Sander Lepla from the Safety Region Haaglanden, and uh, my colleague Tom Hessels from the Netherlands. And together with Matthew, we thought the energy storage systems are a cu crucial element in the energy transitions and the energy mix of the future. In the Netherlands, at least, we are dealing with uh, generating uh, solar power. We are used to uh, wind energy. But the time that the energy is produced and the moment that the energy is being used, there needs to be some buffer. And this buffer is created by those energy storage systems. And we had some recent incidents that made us really aware of the safety risks that go along with those energy storage systems. We know all the incidents from, from Korea, South Korea, but also in our, our own countries we have some incidents. Uh, Arizona, Belgium, Norway, in the Netherlands, Liverpool, and these kind of incidents we should learn from, but also there should be a warning sign for us to really take care of the safety risk in designing these energy storage systems. And this conference deals with the knowledge that we have and how to implement the knowledge in standards and certification schemes so that we have in our the near future really safe, developed and designed energy storage systems. This afternoon we are with, let's say, about 200 attendees. Maybe at this moment they are a bit, bit less, but we had some uh, 200 people that were interested to join. We have 10 speakers. We have three breaks. You all have the schedule. And what I would like to ask to you is, in case you have questions, please post them in the, in the question uh, button on your uh, Teams uh, meeting so that I can use your questions and post them to uh, the speakers that uh, introduce their, their topics. Uh, for me now, it's an honor to introduce Matthew Pace. He is uh, our person from the United States with who we uh, prepared this meeting. And Matthew, would you please be so kind to introduce your part of this uh, great meeting that we are going to have this afternoon? Yes, good morning, Nils. Thank you very much. Let me uh, get this up. Can you uh, see my slides? All right, very good. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is uh, 4 a.m. here in sunny California, and uh, I am very pleased to have been able to participate with this group. Um, I work for Pacific Northwest National Labs. We are a de U.S. Department of Energy funded uh, research lab uh, that is located in the state of Washington on the West Coast. Um, I'm based in California. Uh, our, the work that I do on energy storage safety codes and standards is funded by the Department of Energy's Office of Electricity. Uh, we're fortunate to hear from the manager of the energy storage program at the end of our conference, Dr. Imre Zhuk. But right now, what I'm going to just share with you is a little bit about the genesis of this program. In the United States, uh, we put on a conference uh, each year that's called the Energy Storage Safety and Reliability Forum. And we alternate this conference with our sister lab, Sandia National Labs. And there's just a couple of pictures at the very top here of our last conference, which was held just before uh, we shut down uh, for COVID. Um, and uh, the upper right, we had a really fine presentation by the chief of the Peoria, Arizona Fire uh, Department on the incident that they experienced. And, uh, you know, the bottom left, just some of the research that we do at our lab on uh, the modernizing the grid. 
We also put together a, um, a set of codes and standards reports that we share with uh, anybody who wants them on what's happening uh, in the energy storage industry. Another effort by the Department of Energy is something that's called the Energy Storage Grand Challenge. Um, this is a Department of Energy uh, wide effort to uh, innovate, stimulate uh, advances in energy storage. And I just want to show one slide from a recent report that was produced that shows the estimated growth worldwide of energy storage. And uh, if we look at the gray bars in here, this is Europe. And, uh, you know, it's still very small, but the expected growth over the next several years is quite significant. Um, and the U.S. Uh, is in the darker blue down here. We've got China in the orange. Um, this is the rest of Asia and this is the rest of the world. Um, I think the reason for the drop off here is uh, that the estimates uh, make an adjustment here. But nevertheless, the expected growth is considered to be quite large, um, in some cases up to 15 X of what is installed today, about 10 gigawatt hours. So uh, your timing in attending this conference and learning about energy storage and how it might affect your uh, jobs as a responder uh, is quite important. Another effort that's underway uh, is uh, something called the Grid Storage Launchpad. This is a uh, $75 million investment by the Department of Energy to advance uh, the grid uh, technologies in the US. The idea is really to bring a lot of manufacturers, researchers, industry together at, at one facility. This will be located at our headquarters in Richland. Uh, we seek to validate new technologies um, under realistic grid operating conditions and to really accelerate new technologies uh, in a safe fashion for the industry. So at this point here, I uh, really just want to welcome you. Hopefully each of you uh, can hear and see all the conference as well. Uh, again, as uh, Nils had mentioned, if you have questions, post them in the chat. Um, if presenters have a few minutes after their uh, presentations and we can address a few questions, we will. Um, but uh, Nils, let me pass this one back off to you uh, for our next presentation. Yeah, thank you, uh, Matthew. Great uh, for uh, hearing you stressing the, the importance of at the one side, the safe development of energy storage systems and the grid and at the meantime, also the importance for the for the firefighters and the emergency responders to deal with possible safety risk and also to deal with professional adv advising the safety uh, development of those energy storage systems. And uh, how great it is to have our uh, first speaker from the United States, which is Mr. Sean de Crane. And Sean, he's, uh, he's a researcher at Underwriters uh, Laboratories. And Sean, he's also engage in firefighting. So who is better able than to join at the one side the research and the knowledge and at the other side the firefighter and safety aspects. So Sean, would you please, please be so kind to introduce us in your knowledge and in your uh, experience dealing with energy storage systems and the safety aspects of them and your work as a firefighter as well. Thank you, Nils. It's very, I'm very happy to be here. I finally have lights on now in, in the room that I'm in. Uh, they automatically kick on at 6 a.m. So I'm very privileged to be here. As you mentioned, I spent six, 26 years in the fire service for the Cleveland Fire Department in Cleveland, Ohio, here in the Midwest in the U.S. I also spent 12 years representing the International Association of Firefighters in our codes and standards development. Uh, I began associating with UL approximately 15 years ago while I was still a firefighter looking at research. And I think I'm supposed to go right into the presentation. So I'm gonna share my screen. So I'm gonna bring a fire service perspective to the conference, if if I may. Uh, this actually started 
<clears throat> sorry about that. For me, probably in 2011, when I was still in the fire service and representing the International Association of Firefighters, City of New York realized a couple of natural disasters. They had Hurricane Irene and Superstorm Sandy that came through New York. Uh, what that caused was widespread flooding from Midtown Manhattan down to Lower Manhattan. And many of these buildings had backup emergency power systems, but these were located in the lower levels. So when the building or the businesses wanted to reopen, all of their power systems were underwater. So as they started to recover from these storms, many of these business owners or building owners were looking to modify their emergency power resources. They were no longer looking to go below grade due to the risk of floods, so they started looking above grade. And in a city like New York, that is very significant because above grade is all leasable space and that costs money. So they were really looking at what their options were. And Matt and I have a mutual friend at the Fire Department of New York, and Paul was in their Fire Prevention Bureau, <clears throat> and the, they started to receive a number of permit requests for these energy storage systems. Now we have various, or I should say various installations. Each type of installation brings its own variable to risk assessment. You can have a dedicated ESS building, you can have outdoor remote, installations. We've seen outdoor installations near a building. We've seen rooftop installations. <clears throat> what was really concerning to the FDNY was the fact that these applications were for occupied spaces and they were also applying for permits to use lithium ion batteries. The challenge was is that our codes were very silent in the use of lithium ion batteries. Our codes were based on the use of lead acid systems. And so many of the requirements were specific to lead acid installations. So really what the FDNY was looking for is some guidance within the codes to follow in the approval of these permit requests. Now, the selection of lithium ion makes a lot of good sense if you think about it from an installer's perspective or a building owner or business owner's perspective. What they were looking for because they were dealing with leasable space was a technology that had a lot of energy density. So they didn't have to, they did not want to install large battery rooms, say in the 33rd floor of a high rise, that would be leasable. I can't turn my camera on, Matt, because then I have to stop the presentation. So I appreciate the reach out, but <clears throat> I'd rather have the folks focus on the power on the PowerPoint also in the material. But so they were looking to maximize their leasable space. So that's why they were looking for the energy density. And they naturally started falling to the lithium ion. So since our codes were silent, our codes typically, whether it's NFPA or the International Code Council, which many of our codes are based on, are on three year cycles. And we were just entering into the development cycle of the 2016, or I'm sorry, the 2015 edition of the International Fire Code. So we put together a work group and started to address these requirements within our codes. Uh, now, I really want to mention these were uh, cross-representational. We had manufacturers, we had fire officials, we had building officials, we had consultants from the industry involved in these discussions. And we were working with the knowledge that we had at the time. And most of this knowledge was based on small scale testing. Small scale testing that the industry had done, uh, that some of the research labs had done. We really didn't have access to large scale testing and the results from large scale testing. So that collaborative effort actually brought this out within our codes. And this was the language, the initial language within our fire code at the time. What it said is that we were going to maximize the battery unit to 50 kilowatt hours. And a system was going to be limited to 250 kilowatt hours. And we were going to require a minimum of three foot separation from the unit and the unit from the wall. But as with anything in our codes, there's always an alternative method. And within the code, you can go beyond these restrictions if you can demonstrate that you can meet the desired safety performance. 
So this was now putting that local authority having jurisdiction, your local building or fire official, to evaluate fire tests that were being conducted or proposed to be conducted by the manufacturers and determine whether they could safely alleviate or lift the restrictions on size or distancing. So this really put us into a position where we were testing the code language. So if a manufacturer wanted to go to greater than 50 kilowatt hours or reduce that separation requirement, they were going to have to replicate the test of what you see here. We actually had manufacturers that started to come to the lab at UL. And this is right around the time I was retiring from the fire service and coming to work for UL. And as the industry was researching or investigating the performance at these large scale levels, we started to see some failures. And we saw failures in these larger scale tests that were significant and were concerning. And what it really started to tell us is that we needed to develop a test methodology in order to evaluate the performance of the battery system and to provide information to that local authority having jurisdiction so they can make an informed decision. This led our research and development team here at UL, led by Dr. Pravin Gandhi, Bob Backstrom, and Adam Barrowy, to really start to conduct some research looking at how we could develop a test methodology. That led to the development of UL 9540A, which is actually an addition to UL 9540. What we realized is that we were testing these batteries for electrical performance, but we were not stressing them to the effects of fire. Now, UL 9540A has been adopted into UL 9540, so it is a consensus document. And it's really important to point out that any laboratory can test, as you'll hear later on today, any, any laboratory can test to this test methodology if they have the capabilities. UL does not certify a product to UL 9540A. 9540A is a test methodology to develop the information or the data that the manufacturer or building owner can then engage a fire protection engineer to develop the appropriate fire protection system. And during these initial tests, when we realized failures in these larger scale systems, it really told us that the test could not be a one-off. In other words, a manufacturer shouldn't be able to come to the lab and if they were successful in one attempt, then receive the report that could allow that to be installed in an occupied building, especially when we saw some failures. If that failure had happened in an occupied building, it could have put someone at risk. So we developed a step process. First, we're going to test it at the cell level. And then we're going to evaluate the thermal runaway characteristics and the gas composition and to see what happens with the flaming once that fails. Then we would go to the module level. Again, we're evaluating for the propensity of propagation of runaway. We're evaluating the heat and gas release rates, and we're evaluating deflagration hazards. And basically, I'll show you a flow chart here. If you cannot contain that fire to the box, we're going to evaluate at the unit level. And I'm going to show you some video here of each level of test. This was a flow chart that was created by the research team here at UL to really give an, uh, a guideline on how to follow 9540A. And it shows the cell level and the results of that cell level if it will go to the runaway, which really this can apply to any type of technology in the batteries, and it does. Uh, but we're specific here to uh, lithium ion. If you realize thermal runaway in a cell level test, we're going to go to the module level and then so on. So what are we evaluating at the cell level testing? We're evaluating thermal runaway, the method and the parameters of it. What is the temperature at vetting? Venting, I'm sorry. And then what are the temperatures when we actually transition into thermal runaway? We're measuring the composition of the gases. We're measuring the volume of the gases and the lower flammability and the burning velocity. And I'm going to show you a video here of one of the initial cell level tests in a lab at UL. So we're using an external heating mechanism, just an external heating coil to start to increase the internal temperature of the battery and force it into failure. I think in subsequent testing, we're going to probably take that combustible chair out of the lab so we don't put that at risk. 
But you can see the transition here in a significant amount of flaming, but also if you see the significant amount of off gassing. Under, we're under the cone calorimeter, so we are evacuating that smoke out of that room. But if we start to think that we're in a battery room or we're in a confined space, what kind of conditions are we creating for the occupant of the building? And also, what kind of conditions are we creating for the fire service during a response? And can we use some of this information to educate the fire service on the parameters of their response or develop some tactical considerations? So as you see here, and I think you'll hear in another presentation a little bit later today, some of the gas composition was really concerning. We had 36% carbon monoxide, you had almost 30% of hydrogen. So we kind of, uh, from a fire service perspective, that's what I'm bringing here. I kind of look at that as we have an off-gassing that will burn with the properties similar to propane. And as a firefighter or an incident commander, as I respond to this incident, how close would I put my firefighters if I had a propane leak? And that's the kind of thought process I, I start to bring to the situation. So obviously we realized uh, failure of the cell, ignition, so we're gonna proceed to the module level test. This is a sample of a 9540A report you would receive at the cell level test. Again, I'm gonna hop through a couple of these uh, cells, not cells, I'm sorry, frames, because Monique's gonna share the PDF afterwards. Again, if we follow the flow chart, we saw the off-gassing, the transition to thermal runaway, we're gonna to go to the module level test. That module level testing, uh, again, it's under the cone calorimeter. We're also trying to capture a lot of the same data that we caught from the cell level test, the thermal runaway propagation, the heat release rates. We're looking for deflagration hazards and also the gas measurements, composition and volumes. This is the UL module level test, utilizing the UL developed cells. Uh, you have nine cells to the module. And again, we are going to heat up one cell to drive it to runaway using an external heating coil. And as you can see here, we're producing a lot of the off-gassing. And what we're trying to evaluate or what we are evaluating is the propensity to runaway, but then can this box contain the the effects of the runaway. You know, can we can we keep it in the box? And we seem to be performing fairly well here. And anytime the video slows down, you always know it's going to get interesting. So we see again another cell level failure. You start to see the off gassing. You start to see some sparking though from one of the from the opening there in the box. This is starting to raise the concern. Will this gas ignite? And what would be the result of this ignition? And as you see that, that the volume of the smoke coming out, of the gases coming out, increases due to that pressure, and then we have ignition. And if you look at the bottom right in that lower video, you can see the jet propulsion or the pressure that's being created. And when we looked at the unit level test, I can tell you, you've actually seen that propulsion move the battery unit. So again, when we're evaluating the module level, we did not contain it to the box. So we're gonna say, I think we need to proceed to the unit level test and evaluate it. Again, this, this is the question, pro, the process that we're going through and evaluating the next step. So as I mentioned earlier, much of the information that we were using in the development of our code requirements were based on small scale testing. Most of the large scale testing that had been conducted was proprietary and industry. And it's, you know, it, it's not a judgment in any sense of the imagination. Uh, it's just natural not to publicize your failures. You go back and you redesign your system to reduce those failures or to contain those failures, right? That's the responsible thing to do. But when we were working with the fire service, we were trying to develop tactical considerations for the fire service. What should they be considering? Um, occupant evacuation, what type of ignition, or I, I'm sorry, suppression tactics should they employ? What type of ventilation tactics should they be considering during their deployment? But we didn't have large scale information that we could share. So we approached the International Association of Firefighters, 
and we decided that we were going to collaborate. The IAFF, as I'll refer them to, submitted, and Matt and I have both worked for the IFF for many years in representing them in the codes and standards, so that relationship was very uh, easy for us. They were able to secure a grant that we were then able to go and conduct a unit level test. So we looked at the, the requirements in the fire code, and that's what we based the test on. We have a unit level here. We have three uh, basically modules that are live, and we have a series of modules that have uh, dummy batteries in them. This is a test that was being conducted in our lab here at UL. Again, it's underneath the cone calorimeter. We are going to be evaluating the gas release, the heat release, the gas composition, and its propensity to contain the fire to the box. You see the off-gassing as the cells continue to fail periodically. And it's important to note also that we're approximately 35 minutes into the incident. So the fire department is most likely on scene and evaluating uh, what are the life hazards associated with this scenario? What are the risks that we may uh, be willing to take or what are the next steps? Uh, are we looking at ventilation? Are we looking at suppression? Can we suppress these fires? Can we just maintain these? And there's been a lot of work that's been done by UL, other laboratories, the Department of Defense. And we realized that extinguishing is not necessarily the option, that cooling the surrounding cells and limiting propagation is our best approach. But as we look at 45 minutes into this incident, we still see heavy smoke production. We see the flaming of in that module or the module failing to contain the fire to the box, and we have ignition of, of that smoke. Now, again, in this cone calorimeter, in this room, this laboratory, we're ventilating all of those gases. But if we were in a confined space, say in a battery room in an occupied building, or as Matt will talk about a little bit later with Arizona, in a container, what are the potential risks to that responding firefighter? Right? What do they have to consider? upon arrival and to bring this to a successful conclusion. And at the end of the day, that's the goal of the research is to make sure that uh, we have responsibly designed products and fire protection systems there for the occupants and for the responding fire. So again, uh, during the unit level test, as we go through our assessment, we reached thermal runaway, it was propagating, we did not contain it to the unit. So the next step for the recommendations within UL 9540A is to evaluate the installation uh, situation. What type of fire protection strategies are you going to use? Are you going to use a clean agent system? Are you going to use a sprinkler system? What is the flow rate you're going to use with that sprinkler system? Are you incorporating uh, ventilation. This is a sample of a report. Again, when a manufacturer comes to UL or another certifying body, that this information is proprietary. It is their property and UL maintains that confidentiality. It's one of the tenants of our business, protecting the client's information. But we do realize, well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm sorry. But as we go to the unit level test, again, it's laid out here in this flow chart what exactly we're trying to evaluate. And also we're looking at the NFPA 855, which is our installation standard here in the US. And we're evaluating whether the fire protection systems will provide adequate protection. So as I was saying, I'm sorry, this information is proprietary to that manufacturer, to that client. but in order to receive approval from that local AHJ to either increase the size of your installation or reduce your separation requirements, you're going to have to make that information uh, limitedly public. First of all, we encourage you to take the results of the test and engage a fire protection engineer to design the appropriate protection systems. But then you're most likely going to have to share that report 
with that local AHJ, that building official or fire official who's going to provide that final approval for installation. Most likely you're gonna to have to share with the building owner or an industry representative as they evaluate risk. So that information will certainly be made at least in a limited sense public. This, I think as you'll hear all day today, this is not a, a passing fad. This is an issue that is growing. I don't think anyone here is saying that lithium ion technology is hazardous. We have billions of cells in the marketplace. I think you see this emerging technology and evolving technology and realize it presents challenges for us. And that research is gonna provide us answers or solutions to those challenges. And it has to be done collaboratively. We have to work together across multiple disciplines in order to achieve that. I think the design community is there, the testing community is there, and the fire service needs to be engaged because the designers, the manufacturers, the engineers involved all have to understand the fire service priorities and tactics and vice versa in order to develop a responsible approach. Uh, this is not limited to commercial properties. We've seen, have seen a growth in residential installations as Mac can tell you, California is requiring photovoltaic in one and two family homes, potentially in the very near future. If you're installing photovoltaic, it only makes sense to look at the installation of a battery system. So you could provide the resiliency if you have a shutdown of the grid due to wildland risk or in the event of failure of the grid. So 9540A also addresses the testing of the residential unit. You see that right here, we've seen installations. Uh, I've evaluated the installation of a unit in my home uh, as we work to move forward. Again, at the end of the day, uh, it's. I very much appreciate being involved here at UL and, and being included with my fire service perspective. We're continue, continuously conducting research. I think Matt's gonna talk about our recent container testing, and we are looking to schedule further testing. We have received funding from the Department of Energy and are collaborating with the International Association of Firefighters to evaluate residential ESS installations and develop firefighter tactical considerations specific to that residential setting. So the future is interesting. I look forward to further presentations on this today, and I look forward to our continued collaboration with the fire service and our partners at the international level so we can all understand and work together to provide safety for our citizens and for our firefighters. So thank you very much, Nils. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today and to talk a little bit about our work here at UL. Yes, Sean, uh, thank you very much for your uh, interesting presentations and uh, the videos that, uh, that you showed to us for uh, the experiments that you provided at uh, UL. I see in the chat, uh, in the questions, I see an, uh, a question from uh, from the Netherlands, from uh, from Maarten Mooi. And Maarten asks, and I'll I'll, I'll uh, read his question, and maybe you are able to answer it, uh, Sean. His question is: Thermal runway is an effect which applies to every battery chemistry. What defines a thermal runway for UL 9540A? Uh, so he's looking for the definition of this. Uh, thermal runaway uh, with regard to your uh, test protocol? So, Martin, no, I can't answer that. But no, actually, uh, you know, I'm not the engineer in the group. So it is when it sustains uncontrolled combustion. I know there's a technical term that our research team is using. I can go over there and ask them, but uh, I can certainly provide that here very shortly. All right. Then I think it's an it's an interesting question, uh, and and if you are able to maybe it's later on to 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 specify what makes a thermal runaway a thermal runaway in case of your test protocol, that would be very useful uh, for, uh, for for the for the attendees. Absolutely. Uh, uh, hopefully you're you're able to to do that. Uh, yeah. I don't see any other question, but maybe I, I have one question, and maybe I 
could pose them as well. Uh, I thought that uh, you were uh, presenting some uh, uh, results of your test with uh, carbon dioxide and hydrogen. What I didn't see in your list, but maybe uh, it's, it's too small an amount that, uh, that was released, but we in the Netherlands, we sometimes uh, are concerned with the hydrogen fluoride uh, uh, amount of gas in, uh, in the concentration that is being emitted from a uh, fire with a lithium ion battery. Uh, how do you look at this, uh, this uh, hydrogen fluoride uh, emission? That's certainly a concern. And it not, it's not specific just to lithium ion batteries. There were traces of hydrogen fluoride. Uh, I don't have the exact measurements here, but we also see in some fire protection methods, uh, there's a high level of hydrogen fluoride production. So you have to take that from my personal perspective, you really have to evaluate that also when you look at the fire protection method that you are using, and that would be the installation level. Uh, one thing here at UL, I know that we don't want to replace one hazard with another. So if you have a fire protection method that may be producing very high levels of HF, uh, maybe that's not a recommended approach because you're substituting one risk for another. So that's something that you have to evaluate. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sean. I see there are some other uh, other questions in the chat, and we do have some minutes for uh, for you to to try to answer them. Uh, first of all, I don't know whether who this question posed, but it stays uh, anonymous in the in the in the question. But I will read it, and maybe you are able to to answer that as well, uh, Sean. The question is: Is it possible also to share the movies of the, your tests? Or are they, uh, let's say, uh, confidential? Or who, how do you uh, take care of that? So the unit level uh, test, which is the one that was funded with the grant with the IFF, is available on the IAFF website. We have it there, and that's www.iaff.org. Uh, the other are internal videos. Um, I don't know if they're downloadable but uh, we certainly have presentations that, that are available that, that have those videos included. Uh, if individuals send me an email, I can see about uh, how to share that with you. All right, thank you very much. And then another question, which was posed by uh, Wouter van den Berger. His question is, uh, <laughs> Mr. De Grain, what was the source that caused the thermal runaway and the fire in the end in the test? Uh, and he also, put some suggestion of itself like uh, overtension, overcharging. So he was looking for the cause of the thermal runaway. Oh, so what we did in each of our tests, we used a heating coil to use an external heating drive to increase the temperature internally of the battery, which would then force it in a runaway. And it was a consistent method that we could use sh short of driving a nail into each battery. So. That was the most consistent method that we could, that was repeatable, is the internal heating. All right, thank you. For in internal heating was the cost. And Wouter has also another question. Uh, and Oh, sorry, it was uh, Paul Gregory who posed a question, and I will read it as well. Uh, and uh, he says, uh, the hydrogen fluoride production is uh, dictated by uh, the lithium ion battery chemistry. I can send you the details, and he posts his uh, his email uh, address. I think it's uh, if is Paul is is willing to that we are also willing to share that with other attendants in the in this uh, in this conference. So uh, we all have the same uh, knowledge because that is one of the goals of the 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 conference that that we are aiming at: share the knowledge that we need to develop. Uh, safe energy storage systems and also to develop safe emergency response procedures. So that makes, I think, uh, the first part of this uh, high speed knowledge intensive uh, energy storage system safety conference. We have a short break. Uh, this break will uh, last till, uh, let's see, at the schedule, will last to uh, five minutes to two. So we have a break of 15 minutes. And after the break, we will start with Hulan Bishop from RISE, 
who will present his research efforts and results from uh, his institute. So hopefully I will see you in 15 minutes again uh, at, uh, let's say, at the screen. And we will join then uh, Rulofi's introduction regarding uh, the safety aspects and research uh, initiatives at, uh, at RISE in Sweden. So thank you much for attending and hopefully I see you in 15 minutes. Yeah, everyone. Here we are again at uh, five minutes to uh, to two. At least it is in the in the Netherlands. Uh, we had a, a great introduction from uh, from Sean, and now we are uh, back with you in uh, in an hour. The next hour we will have uh, three presentations uh, dealing with uh, all those relevant aspects that uh, make uh, energy storage systems as safe as they are now, but also the kind of research that is being conducted to let's say, to, to support that safety design. And first uh, speaker is uh, Roland Bishop. Roland, uh, he's a guy from the Netherlands, but he works in Sweden. He, uh, he works for the Swedish Research Institute, right? And he will deal with uh, the examinations and the research that is being conducted by RISE, also the tests that they are doing. And he will he give us more insight in uh, the test results and also the lessons that they learn from their tests and how they might even be part of a new code for the future to uh, to design and to develop a, a real uh, safe energy source system. So, Roland, if you are ready, I would like to give the floor to you and please uh, introduce us in, in your organization and the work that you conduct and uh, the results that it is being uh, given to us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Niels. And uh, let me just show my presentation while I get started. Uh, yeah, so as mentioned, I'll be talking a bit about uh, what we've been doing at the lab in uh, Sweden in doing tests and doing research and trying to get a better understanding on the, the failure methods of lithium ion batteries and what to think of for uh, coming up with safe solutions. Uh, so yeah, I'm a guy from the Netherlands, as mentioned, Roland Bischof. Uh, working at RISE in Sweden and what we do here in Sweden is uh, we try where we are the research institute and innovation partner for every part of the society. Um, that of course sounds very nice but in practice what this means is that we work together with academia and industry to uh, to help them develop their products and to do research uh, and um, develop yeah just uh, yeah and uh, the thing that we also are involved in is with doing like standardized testing, so certifying products. And if you need to get a CE mark for something, uh, you can come to us and we can help you with that. And uh, I work uh, here in uh, Boros in uh, Sweden at the fire research uh, group. And here we have a very large fire hall, which can uh, measure up to 15 megawatts. Uh, not, not too long ago, we, we burned a couple of uh, electric cars here, but uh, I won't talk too much about that in this talk. I will focus more on the energy storage systems and particularly those that use uh, lithium ion batteries. Um, I'm sure you have seen this many times before, so I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but lithium ion batteries, they have very many good qualities and uh, the thing is that they also have some safety issues involved, but there's also they're not necessarily more dangerous than traditional fuels. I would say there's just still many lessons that we need to learn. I mean, nowadays you wouldn't think think twice about filling your car with that gasoline, for example, but it's, it's quite dangerous actually when you think about it. Um, and one different thing, one important thing to know about lithium ion batteries is that, of course, there are different lithium ion batteries. The, the type of chemistry that you consider, the cathode or anode, which are like the negative uh, or the positive and the negative uh, parts of the battery cell, they can have a very large effect on how a battery will behave during eventual failure. Um, even the format of the cell, if it's a pouch cell or a cylindrical cell or a prismatic cell, all of these have a um, significant effect on the, on the outcome of, uh, say, a failure event. Um, but anyways, these cells, they're all connected to reach very high uh, amounts of energy. So you connect individual cells to form a module, you connect modules to form a pack, and that way you can go from, say, 0.01 kilowatt hour in your smartphone, which is just one single battery cell, all the way up to, say, 4,000 kilowatt or maybe even greater uh, just by collecting these individual battery cells together. 
And the issues with these individual battery cells that are inside the battery pack is that they have, uh, yeah, kind of a fundamental issue. And that is if you exceed certain operational limits, you may at some point introduce some damage or some uh, trigger some degradation mechanisms inside the battery cell that could immediately cause issues or in a longer period of time cause issues, may also not cause issues at all. Um, but when issues are caused, they can be very severe. And the most severe one is the thermal runaway uh, event. And that is when you have very rapid self-heating of the battery cell combined with uh, production of flammable gas, toxic gas, a uh, large amount of heat that is being generated, and uh, you also see uh, lots of sparks. So you, you get multiple hazards. You have the fire hazard, toxic hazard, and also the explosion hazard in case the flammable gases produced by the cells are not immediately ignited. Um, at RISE, we've been working together with the ship manufacturer to uh, come up with a safety concept for uh, for an electric uh, passenger ship. And uh, some some of the thoughts we had behind this concept was that um, on the ship they are using uh, basically energy storage systems similar to what you see on land. Is this a structure in which uh, is which houses a large amount of lithium-ion batteries. Um, you could see the same type of structure on land as you would see on the ship, for example. And in this room, uh, our belief is that whatever ventilation or exposure uh, protection that is considered in this, in this room uh, should be um, based on what you would define as the casualty unit. So um, we consider that to be the largest number of parallel connected cells, the largest unit without external short circuit protection, or the unit of cells for which uh, you, you know that thermal runaway will not propagate further than past that unit or whatever is created in these cases. Um, as part of this project, we've also been looking at uh, kind of a worst case scenario, say like, um, a very uh, the, this unit of cells is quite large it is like a, a module which is kind of like a box that is part of a of a large um, battery rack you could say let's say that entire box of unit uh, of cells fails and how can we then prevent that um, this this uh, thermal runaway propagates from that furry box to other boxes um, and what we what we were looking at it was uh, we looked at thermal runaway propagation tests and uh, sort of similar to what has been uh, done in the past, for example, by uh, DNV. And what we built was a mock-up of uh, energy storage uh, rack. And in this mock-up, we had one live battery module and then surrounding that live battery module, we had mock-up modules. And what we did is we initiated the thermal runaway with a, a burner at the back of the uh, live module and then we looked at how do the temperatures spread through the remainder of the dummy modules uh, and how can we uh, how can we inject uh, fire suppression uh, fire suppressant in between uh, these modules at the best uh, way to get uh, to actually prevent that thermal runaway spreads further from this um, yeah casualty unit so to say um, so yeah we have one live module in the middle the rest are dummy modules and um, for this particular method that we're looking at here, it's a bit different than say UL 9548. What we're looking at here is specifically to, to compare how, uh, how different fire suppression system setups or how different fire suppression uh, agents can uh, be effective in uh, hindering thermal runaway propagation. So um, it's, it's a different kind of, uh, yeah way that we're looking at things in these particular tests. And we looked at the uh, live modules that had about five kilowatt hours of uh, energy stored. And uh, we also looked at two different chemistries and uh, form factors. So in this case, we had a module with cylindrical cells, so small cylindrical cells like you see in, uh, say, a Tesla. And they have the uh, CNMC chemistry and about 500 cells uh, in this box. Uh, and I have a short video here which shows you kind of what happens at the initial stages. Like uh, there's first a cell that vents a small amount of gas. Um, this is after 13 minutes of heating uh, the battery pack with a burner from behind. So it takes some time to, to get uh, things started actually. So that was the main thing. There was a small puff of gas there. And then 
three minutes later, this uh, small puff of gas had developed quite significantly. Uh, where you see that every at different stages, the thermal runaway propagates from one cell to the next cell and then the next cell. And then you see kind of like a flare up of gas or flammable gas being released and uh, this gas is igniting. In our case, we are we are igniting gas with uh, with um, pilot igniters around the sides because we want to later investigate the effectiveness of fire suppression systems. Uh, so we want to we want there to be a fire and want to see how much can we uh, reduce the fire. That's what it looks like at 20 minutes. And uh, 25 minutes, we had the largest fire. After this, the fire started to reduce in size. But you can see that from the live module, um, if there were real modules above of this live module, chances are that it would have propagated. So our goal is to prevent that from happening with uh, with fire suppression systems. Uh, we also looked at uh, LFP. Uh, cells, which are often uh, thought of as uh, safer chemistry in, uh, in some aspects. And uh, we had a similar amount of uh, energy stored, but the individual cells were were larger. So the cells themselves contain much more energy. So we only had uh, 30 cells in this case. Uh, here, I don't have a video, but uh, I'd like to point out the time. So here it took significantly longer to uh, initiate the thermal runaway to begin with. And also in between the different um, yeah, fire intensities or the thermal runaway to propagate through the pack, it took much uh, a bit longer in this case as well. And that's most clearly seen in, in this graph, uh, which shows the heat release rate from the different tests. So we synchronize the times here with respect to when the first, first cell went into thermal runaway. So the NMC case, we see a very uh, quick thermal runaway propagation and quite a large amount of heat being produced in a relatively short amount of time. Whereas when we did the test on the LFP cells, it took very long in between the, uh, yeah, for the thermal runaway to propagate through the module. And we also see that the overall heat release rate is, uh, is not as high. Um, well, we measured the temperatures of all the remaining modules in this uh, rack. So they are like uh, the dummy modules. And uh, it was quite clear that all of the uh, surfaces that you that, that are highlighted here in orange, all of those exceeded uh, 200 degrees uh, eventually during the test. So this illustrates sort of, I mean, in the real situation, you would also have safety systems and heat barriers in between the, the modules. So this is kind of like a worst case kind of setup, but without the fire suppression system or any other uh, mitigating actions, it would have propagated through the entire uh, rack most likely. And, and for comparison also included these uh, guidelines from uh, DMV where they state that 85 degrees Celsius is the fair criteria for when you consider dummy modules in, uh, in your test. But again, I want to make very clear that this is kind of like a worst case uh, scenario uh, that we are looking at in our test setup. Um, so what we will do uh, shortly after summer in August, we will uh, repeat the identical test and then we will have uh, the same kind of fire suppression uh, setup uh, to compare a number of different uh, agents like water mist F500, uh, AVD, aqueous vermiculite dispersion, water spray, and then inert gas to, to get an understanding for how, how do they um, control or how do they limit the intensity of fire and reduce the risk that thermal runaway may propagate, but also to get an understanding of um, how should we actually design our fire suppression systems in the future to, yeah, to make sure that they are effective when they are needed. Um, another aspect of the batteries that is not related to necessarily what I showed before is the uh, explosion and the toxic gas hazard. Before it was mostly the fire hazard. And for that, we also looked at uh, a safety concept for, uh, uh, for energy storage systems, um, which I won't go through in 
to too much detail, but basically you need to have a basic amount of ventilation in your in your system, but also be able to uh, prevent or evacuate uh, any flammable gases that may be produced by a single cell away from any potential ignition sources. And um, in this case, uh, I'll show you some uh, tests we actually did according to the UL9540A standard together with uh, with our friends from the United States and in, uh, in Chicago from UL. They uh, helped us perform these tests. Uh, and um, in this case, there were two uh, distinct uh, phases we found uh, in our tests. Um, so in our tests, what we looked at were uh, modules. Uh, so uh, similar to what was shown before, it was a metal box filled with, uh, yeah, battery cells that we assembled ourselves and then we initiated the thermal runaway in one of those battery cells uh, with uh, with a heating element and then we just allow it to to propagate uh, and what we found in this test was there was a very clear uh, distinction between two phases of the of the thermal runaway event after we like initiate the very first uh, thermal runaway in the battery cell and there was there was a pre-flaming phase and a flaming phase so pre-flaming was large amounts of flammable gas being produced but no uh, combustion and uh, we did, we had an FTR set up to uh, screen for HF and we didn't detect any HF then and uh, there were very large amounts of uh, CO and uh, total hydrocarbons produced in that case. When we had the flaming, we did detect uh, HF being produced and uh, very high amounts of CO2, of course, and less CO and uh, hydrocarbons. And this is what the pre-flaming phase looked like. So you see quite large clouds of flambo gas are being produced here. Other than that, there's no there's no fire, there's no flame. Let's see. And then the flaming phase. It's also interesting to to note the times. The last one was around 40 minutes into the test, and this is around 60 65 minutes. So this is still flammable gas being produced and then at some point there comes a spark most likely from one of the battery cells uh, which ignites the gas there we go and from this point on it was just uh, yeah, combustion for uh, until the end of the test Um, so this is kind of the time, the yeah, the the gas measurements we did over time. So you see, the carbon monoxide was primarily detected when the gas was being produced, but there was no combustion yet. Uh, around 60 minutes, when the gas ignites, no more carbon monoxide is recorded, then carbon dioxide goes up. And uh, similarly for the uh, total hydrocarbons, uh, so around 40 minutes, that's when we still have large amounts of hydrocarbons being recorded. And once uh, there's ignition of the uh, flammable gas, it drops. Um, this is the uh, HF measurements. Oh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but what you see here is that we only recorded or we could detect HF uh, once when there was combustion. There may have been HF before then, but our measurement system was not sensitive enough to pick that up, but it could pick up that there was HF being produced when there was uh, combustion. And to look I quickly want to show you a bit about what these flammable gases may look like uh, in more detail. So this is a UL9548 test in our uh, reactor, which uh, UL was uh, helped us to uh, to build. And this is an NMC cell, and uh, we do these tests in an inert environment, so there's no no oxygen there. Um, and we had a small camera within the reactor and. It shows you kind of what happens. There's a release of gas, some sparks, and the gas ignites, and there's a flame for some period of time. 
uh, for at least as long as oxygen is being uh, released by the battery cell. So it's, it's, it's a short period of time that there is conduction, but there is some combustion despite the inert environment. Um, for the for other tests that we've done, for example, LFP cells, uh, same test method, we do not have any combustion in the in the in the reactor. Um, often, when we do these tests on LFP cells in the out in the open air, we don't see uh, self ignition either. Uh, in this case, we have uh, quite high amounts of hydrogen, however. Yeah, uh, so that's kind of the. Uh, to summarize the uh, the talk uh, for me today and uh, mostly focused on yeah fire testing and how that can be useful and give you input into designing your energy storage systems or, or even to have an understanding of uh, of what risks you may have when things do go wrong um, and there are different ways to to do this um, so we have done many tests according to this uh, ul 9540a standard and um, hopefully in the future we'll be able to to contribute to um, to uh, to the world of standards by having a test method that can be used to uh, evaluate uh, fire suppression systems and compare their effectiveness for uh, lithium ion battery fires um, yeah so i think i'll conclude it there um, in case anyone has any questions i can i don't know maybe I have some time left otherwise you can send me an email here uh, so yeah, thank you very much. Yes, Wolot, thank you very much for uh, your presentation regarding the, the research activities and the testing in uh, in your laboratories at Burwas in uh, in Sweden. Uh, first of all, I saw a question from uh, from Martin Moy. He's he's from the Netherlands, and he will be the next presenter, uh, by the way. And Martin mm -hmm. uh, asks. Uh, What's the main difference between your investigations at RISE and testing and the one at uh, DNV? Uh, can you uh, elaborate on the differences between your test and the one that is being conducted by DNV, uh, Roland? Uh, I don't know in detail what tests they are conducting. I know they have conducted tests in the past on it's very similar to what we have done. Uh, but our, our approach is to, uh, yeah, to kind of further develop on the work that they have done and uh, see if uh, if there's a potential to get like a nice uh, repeatable standardized test set up for fire suppression systems. Um, All right, thank you, Ron. Maybe a short question for me. In August uh, this year, you uh, will be conducting some uh, fire suppression systems. Uh, yeah. Are they also uh, focused at the the three? Uh, shapes of the of the of the lithium ion batteries like uh, prismatic cylindrical and and pouch cells or are they at one of those shapes uh, focus what what can you yeah. deliver it a little bit more on the the, the fire suppression uh, test in the uh, this year yeah so it's essentially identical to what i showed um, in my talk so we will both look at modules that have uh, nmc battery cells uh, cylindrical and modules that have uh, prismatic lfp cells so we those are the modules we have available so um, those we will be uh, testing for fire suppression tests as well so these were kind of the the reference tests which we will later compare the fire suppression tests to all right and then uh, I think uh, also because of uh, of the time, uh, we will uh, continue with uh, the next uh, presentation, which is uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, two guys from the Netherlands will present, and I will ask uh, them to uh, to prepare. And it's uh, first of all uh, Stefan, Stefan Oldhorn. Uh, Stefan is uh, affiliated as a program manager energy uh, at FME in the Netherlands, and he's a platform manager at uh, at Energy Storage NL. So. Stefan, would you be so kind to uh, to start the presentation and when you're ready to hand over to uh, Martin for the for the follow up? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Niels, uh, for the introduction and uh, I will uh, I will start my uh, my presentation. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Stefan Olstorn, as, as Niels mentioned. I'm uh, I'm the uh, manager for the energy storage in L platform in uh, in the Netherlands. Um, 
Energy Storage Now is the uh, association for the Dutch energy storage industry. Uh, we represent over 80 companies and organizations that are working in the energy storage industry in, in, the, in the Netherlands. And yes, this is an old picture. We need to update this picture because we recently gained some new member companies, um, which I still should include uh, in, this, uh, in this picture. Um, these companies are developing a wide variety of technologies and are developing a wide variety of projects, not only battery energy storage, um, uh, but I will tell you a little bit today about uh, why we want to use battery energy storage in the energy transition. Um, I will not talk as much about uh, battery safety. I think there are many specialists on the program of this conference who can do a lot better job at that uh, than I can. Um, what I will focus is on uh, is what is the application of energy storage in the energy transition and, um, and so why do we want to use uh, uh, battery energy storage. Um, and well, the main reason uh, between uh, the main reason why we want to use battery energy storage is because that we will see that there is a mismatch between supply and demand of energy in the energy transition. Um, on the right hand of the screen, you can see a, a plot of a nice uh, uh, spring day, uh, not as nice as, as today, in, unfortunately, or well, a little bit, bit nicer, actually, I should say, than today. It's a bit gray here in the Netherlands today. Uh, but what you clearly can see, there's a big peak of solar PV production uh, at the middle of the day. There's a lot of wind. And if we uh, plot a typical demand profile over uh, over that uh, you can see there's a great mismatch between supply and demand of uh, of energy um, uh, demand is is big during the morning and been during the evening peaks while supply uh, peaks during midday and we will need to be able to shift the the, the surplus that we have during midday to uh, the morning and evening peaks if we want to match renewable energy supply with uh, energy demand in the energy transition. Another issue is that, and that is an issue that we're currently seeing a lot in, in the Netherlands, is the issue of grid capacity. Um, the, the electrical grid has a certain capacity. It takes a long time to re reinforce the electrical grid. Um, and uh, if we only have short term peaks, which we want to, um, which we want to uh, address, uh, then it could be better to do this with a uh, energy storage system than by increasing the, the grid capacity. And what I show here is that, I, sh I show here are two big uh, uh, demand peaks in more morning and in the evening and one big supply peak, but these kind of peaks also uh, take place throughout the day on seconds or minute basis. And what we see here is uh, actually the issue with, with grid capacity in the Netherlands at the moment. Um, we've seen a very rapid increase of solar PV generation in the Netherlands, especially uh, in the areas outside of the, of the cities, uh, which typically uh, are, are farming areas and, and don't have a very strong uh, um, uh, electrical grid. There's not a lot of electricity demand. Uh, so uh, all this uh, new solar PV uh, generation um, cannot be fed into the relatively small grid that's available in these uh, in these areas. And actually, in all the areas that are plotted in red, um, uh, it's no longer possible to connect new uh, solar PV uh, to uh, to the grid. And this is something that we're currently seeing with um, with the, the the rise of solar PV. But the same could happen um, if a large industrial sites will switch from natural gas to electricity as a main source of energy uh, that will rapidly increase the demand for electricity in those areas. And also that will create a lot of peaks, uh, which uh, the grid is not able to uh, to comply with. And therefore, we need energy storage technologies to be able to match uh, supply and demand of, uh, of electricity. Energy storage uh, has many uh, different technologies. Um, uh, we can, this, uh, this picture unfortunately is in Dutch, but uh, what I can tell you is on the bottom left, 
uh, you can see very uh, short term, uh, high uh, uh, short term energy storage systems with with low capacities like uh, super caps or flywheels. Uh, then there's the battery energy storage systems, uh, which we will talk about today, which are typically suited for storing energy from a few minutes up to a few hours or a day uh, and can go up to uh, hundreds of megawatt hours. Um, and if you want to store energy in, in larger amounts for longer times, you will go to power to gas or um, uh, thermal energy storage systems. Uh, Martin will talk a little bit more about this uh, later in the in the presentation. What are we currently seeing in the Netherlands today? Um, particularly combinations of renewable energy uh, generation with battery energy storage technology. So on the left hand side you can see a, uh, a wind park that's being combined with a battery energy storage system. On the right hand side you can see the first hybrid park of the Netherlands which includes both solar PV, wind and storage and which can actually act as a uh, um, carbon uh, free uh, uh, source of flexible energy. Uh, another uh, application that we see is in the commercial and industrial uh, applications and here battery energy storage systems are primarily used for peak shaving so for peak shaving of demand uh, take for instance on the on the right hand side uh, these uh, these forklifts these are electrical forklifts which use opportunity charging so when the the forklift driver goes for a cup of coffee he charges the the forklift very rapidly with a high high power and this power is not drawn from the grid because that will create a large spike on the on the grid. Uh, instead, it's drawn from the battery, which can slowly be uh, charged from uh, from the grid. Uh, other applications that we're seeing is a mobile energy storage systems. These can these can both be used for for temporary uh, uh, renewable generation, or in this case, at a festival. Uh, where there's not uh, enough um, uh, grid capacity available uh, and these uh, energy storage systems can also do a lot of peak shaving. And finally, uh, of course, residential applications. To be perfectly honest, we don't see a lot of residential applications in the Netherlands yet. Um, that, be, that is because we have a net metering scheme uh, in place. Um, I will not go in, in depth to that. It's a, it's a market mechanism thing. Uh, which doesn't create a high demand for residential energy storage in the Netherlands at the moment, but in the countries uh, surrounding us like Germany and Belgium, uh, we see a high demand for, for residential energy storage systems. What are the revenues that you can gain with, uh, with a battery energy storage system? Well, uh, the thing is at the moment that batteries are relatively still very expensive, uh, so you will need to stack different types of revenue streams in order to make a viable business case. Uh, at this moment in time, the most attractive market for battery energy storage systems is the frequency, frequency containment reserve market, uh, which is a market that our uh, transmission system operator uh, uses to keep the grid frequency up uh, to 50 hertz. Uh, other uh, markets that can be used are uh, imbalance markets, so uh, trying to keep the supply and demand of electricity uh, in the very short term in, in balance, or arbitrage markets, so buying energy cheap and selling it for a higher price at a later time. What we can expect as well in the, in the future is our markets that are focusing on these congestion issues where the grid capacity is exceeded, like in these red spots in the Netherlands, which I showed you earlier, uh, and all types of uh, peak shaving cases, uh, which I explained about in the commercial and industrial applications. What we are also seeing is that Indeed, batteries are still expensive, but the costs are rapidly declining, uh, and this is especially driven by the, the, the rise of electromobility. Uh, this also creates a uh, business case, it could create a business case in a few years for the second use application of, of uh, EV batteries that have gone below 80% of capacity, uh, which can still be used for a few years for stationary applications. And of course, this also calls for the right safety measures. And uh, something, and this is the, the segue to, uh, to Martin, our, our next speaker, um, 
there are a lot of new technologies coming up to the market uh, for stationary applications, which often also use less scarce materials uh, and which are um, inherently safer. So this is also a development that's ongoing at the moment. Um, so that's it from my side uh, for now, and uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to give the word over to, uh, to Martin. So Stefan, uh, thank you very much. I hope my uh, my presentation is shown now. We switch to a slideshow, and I hope everybody can uh, can now clearly see it. Um, I'm very limited in, in what I can see, of course, here. Um, so my name is Martin Moy. I'm um, uh, supporting Conan Industries. I mainly work for uh, a few parties. Um, which are connected to Kohler Industries. Uh, most of those um, companies are also connected to uh, Energy Storage NL or the FME, uh, FMA, as Stefan was uh, talking about. And um, uh, the main goal of Kohler Industries is to, uh, is to support the uh, enabling of the energy transition, which is ongoing. So uh, when we look, we have a few uh, basic assumptions for this energy uh, transition. Um, for sure, everybody will know what happened. Uh, clean energy is already cheaper to generate than uh, the fossil energy. Uh, next, with the electrification of all transport, the most industrial machines will happen, but the main energy carrier and most of the really large equipment might not be in batteries. Um, another assumption that we have is the clean energy is generated when the sun shines, the wind blows, but it cannot be stored in very large quantities at the moment. So we suspect it will not be in batteries, but probably in heat and liquids like uh, hydrogen and ammonia. So there are several um, storage techniques that will have specific advantages. Um, these are batteries. We have lithium batteries, we have flow batteries. Um, there's heat, uh, both in solid and liquids. We have hydrogen and we have ammonia. And uh, well, the energy transition it requires a change of an energy system and also the mindset of the people. So more and smaller decentralized systems are needed and we have to change our habits in the, in the energy use. So uh, you use it more uh, when it's available. So if we have improved insulation, we can cool fridges, heating metal more when the sun shines and heat houses less during the night. So there's a, a large decentralized infrastructure for charging and connectivity needs to be developed and built, and uh, therefore we need new software systems and platforms in order to, uh, to enable this. So if we look to the code industries themselves, uh, we're trying to combine all these uh, sectors. So we have solar energy, uh, there's battery energy storage, we have a power to X and X to power, uh, the X can be heat, for example, and then we have some users like the e-mobility and the end users. All these parties uh, need to be uh, connected. So if we take a look to the companies, there are several companies active in all these uh, areas. Um, and there's a whole list. You can later on uh, see them. I will uh, uh, highlight uh, three of them um, to show uh, what we are working on from the industry's perspective. So the first interesting one, which is different from battery energy storage systems, is Kraft Block, which uh, uses thermal energy storage. Um, this is uh, interesting as um, the uh, industrial waste heat is also a kind of a renewable energy. Uh, the waste heat can be stored, can be converted to electrical energy on a very high, uh, with a high efficiency. Um, this is done by uh, using a form of granular, which is used to absorb and store the uh, thermal energy. And uh, thermal energy uh, storage is um, uh, available as a short term and seasonal storage, uh, depending on the design. It can absorb both uh, low temperature heat or high temperature heat and release it uh, again as high temperature for industrial applications or low temperature to heat it in buildings and water. Um, in addition to storing thermal energy, uh, the most important goal of heat storage systems is to decouple the generation and use of heat over time. So there are basically three systems in which thermal energy storage is uh, used. Uh, the 
most uh, known one is sensible heat accumulators. This uh, heat accumulator changes the, let's say, sensible temperature during charging and discharging processes. And uh, the heat capacity is a most important parameter in this storage material. Uh, since the type uh, does not undergo any phase transformations, it can be used over a wide temperature range. Uh, so let's say from room temperature up to 1300 degrees in the high temperature range. Um, in addition, the thermal energy can also be conserved in a latent heat storage system. Um, they don't change their uh, perceptible temperature during the charging or discharging process, but the heat storage medium changes its aggregate state. So it's usually the transition from solid to liquid or the other way around. And the storage of this medium can be uh, charged or discharged beyond uh, its latent heat capacity, uh, which only then leads to a temperature increase or a decrease. And the last variant is thermal chemical uh, heat storage, uh, whereas thermal chemical heat stores uh, heat through endothermic reactions and release it again through exothermic uh, reactions. If we look to a certain project, it's it's ongoing and um, uh, it's being applied in the ceramics industry where it started to recycle process waste heat uh, by capturing the thermal energy of the created flue gas, uh, storing it and then reusing it to preheat uh, production components. As you can see, uh, um, the amount of storage by capacity, 1.2 megawatt hour per cubic uh, meter is, is quite high. Um, you have up to 1300 degrees of temperature storage for long term and uh, a theoretically infinite uh, lifespan for this. Um, next to it, um, I have to switch my uh, my screen and for some reason it doesn't. I don't see my presentation anymore. Is this correct? We can still, we can see, still it. see it. Uh, I cannot see it. <laughs> so that's it. Oh, there it is. The next in a row uh, with a different kind of energy storage system is Aedestor. Uh, Aedestor uses um, hydrogen bromide solutions in order to uh, store and release um, uh, their energy. And um, they, uh, they are using uh, the flow battery uh, technique basically to generate electricity by using three photons. Uh, photons sorry. Um, they use a flow battery, they are using stacks, and um, in the stack they are using membranes. And each membrane in the stack is on one side in contact with the electrolyte circuit, um, which is an uh, aqueous solution of uh, hydrobromic acid and bromide, and on the other side it's hydrogen gas circuit. So both of these active materials uh, circulate in a closed loop uh, uh, along their own respective side of the cell. And, and these, and the electrolyte and the hydrogen are separated by this proton conductive membrane. Uh, and in this way, you, uh, Elistor is, is combining two processes with a single membrane. And the cell operates as an electrolyzer during charge, and um, is, uh, uh, during uh, discharge, is being used as a fuel cell. Um, it's, it's a, it's a. It shows a high uh, yeah, resemblance with a more mechanical machine rather than a closed loop battery pack. Uh, all the parts like the stacks, uh, pumps, valves, uh, uh, control electronics are easily accessible. Uh, therefore, uh, the system can be uh, serviced and upgraded always. Um, and contrary to the typical closed battery packs, um, what we see in the lithium battery packs. Uh, furthermore, the exchange of the stacks uh, after about 10,000 cycles uh, gives the system a full second life. Uh, this leads to a reduction of storage costs uh, per kilowatt hour and the bottom line uh, to a further and return on investment. So this is an uh, interesting technology to, um, to keep track as it will uh, provide a very uh, specifically a very uh, cheap way of storing uh, huge amounts of, um, of energy. The other uh, one I want to highlight is the uh, is an innovation for the battleizer. The battleizer is more like a basically a battery. A, it seems like a high and hybrid uh, system. And the advantage uh, of the battleizer is basically the um, nickel iron battery, 
which when it's fully charged, it produces hydrogen. Um, in the past, this was seen as the negative effect of this battery because uh, hydrogen is uh, highly flammable. It uh, was an unwanted effect. But now uh, we are capable of, uh, let's say, charging the battery. And when it's fully charged, uh, both the nickel and the um, uh, iron uh, act are being used as an um, uh, electrolyzer, uh, creating the hydrogen. And now we can capture the hydrogen um, and use this uh, as, a, as a fuel as well. So therefore, um, uh, the advantage is that when there is a, um, a storage of energy needed, that it can be stored in the in the battery, and at the same time there is a constant uh, production of hydrogen, which in its turn can be used to uh, create, uh, for example, uh, ammonia. And hydrogen can also be uh, be stored for uh, for a long time. It's a very efficient process, uh, currently under under development, and uh, this year a, um, a new system will be uh, uh, will be released. It all comes together basically um, by connecting everything together, as we can see in this uh, this slide. Is there's the grid in the center? Um, there's a wind, solar. Um, feeding the grid basically and energy from the grid can be used for an electrolyzer to create um, to create hydrogen which can then on itself be stored. Uh, we can use to produce ammonia which can be used as fertilizer, it can be sold, it can be used by barns, milking, irrigation equipment, etc. Um, the grid is providing energy to batteries which then can be stored. Uh, the energy from the battery can also be used on the side. Uh, when we look to um, the upper right side, we have the solar uh, energy. We have uh, energy from um, geo um, uh, uh, sources, and we have the Rio, which is basically the waste of uh, waste heat of, of water. Um, those all produce heat. The heat can then be also be stored, can be used by a factory, uh, for example, to preheat. Uh, uh, production components, uh, the heat can also then again be, uh, be reused. All this uh, needs to be connected uh, together in, uh, in the smart grid, which is, um, which is the last innovation part of it, um, uh, where all these um, um, uh, tiers, basically users and um, uh, providers of energy are to be um, connected together and being controlled. Um, when we look to this schematic, we see uh, a tier A device uh, at this level of device. It uh, cannot communicate with the rest of the energy system. It's basically uh, something like a dump load. It's just uh, us as people in our homes. Um, we can add or subtract energy uh, whenever we are enabled, uh, where the rest of the system needs to be adjusted, uh, adjusted to this uncontrollable demand. And the tier we go to the uh, conclusions. We are shortly running out of time, so. Yeah, yeah, this is my last slide, which I explained. <laughs> so uh, the TRB devices are a device can communicate with the microgrid, but they cannot be controlled uh, with the possible exception of emergency shutdown. We have the tier C uh, devices, which are they can communicate with the micro microgrid and have a limited control functionality and the device can be switched on or not. And the tier D devices, uh, these are the highest level of devices where the device can be adjusted uh, based on the demands. And the energy generation or energy consumption is actively adjusted in the situation. And where we see an important role is in the secondary control, but also the tertiary control, where we can, let's say, um, what we can uh, buy energy uh, at a certain uh, uh, cost and we can sell it again. Let's say so we can keep control over where is the energy being produced, where can we use it, and in this way we can basically perform a high level also trading the, uh, the energy. So this is uh, my part of the uh, presentation. This is where we um, we see the innovation has to take place to connect all kinds of different energy storage systems uh, together in a uh, in a functional uh, smart grid, basically. Yeah, Martin and, and Stefan, thank you, thank you very much for uh, for introducing your uh, insights into both the 
typical parts of the energy storage systems. The various chem chemistries that are behind that. I saw ammonia, I saw uh, hydrogen, I saw the battery electric uh, storage systems. Thank you very much for, the, for these insights. Uh, I look at the, the questions in the, in the chat, but they aren't uh, there. So what I would like to, uh, to do is to, to continue the program. And uh, our next speaker is uh, also from the Netherlands. It's a close colleague of mine. It's uh, Mr. Tom Hessels. He's also the one who prepared this meeting with uh, Matthew Pace from the United States and Sander Lepla from Veiligheidsregio Haaglanden. And Tom will uh, present some of the guidelines that we formulated for uh, energy storage systems on typical places, like for example, rooftops of uh, enormous uh, uh, flats and, and buildings. So Tom, would you please be so kind to start your presentation and give us the knowledge that you already have? Yes, thank you, Niels, for your uh, introduction. Hi, guys. My name is Tom Hessels. I'm a researcher on energy and transportational safety at the Dutch Institute for Safety. Normally, I would give this presentation together with my colleague Sander Lepelaar from the safety region Haaglanden, but unfortunately, he couldn't uh, make it. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about the situation that we have in the Netherlands when it comes to battery. We take a look at the past, present and future situation in the Netherlands around energy storage from a firefighting perspective when it comes to the risk mitigation of batteries, especially around energy storage systems. And what we will see is that there is a mismatch between the theoretical situation, for example, legislation and reg regulations, and the situation in practice around ESS in the Netherlands. The brief content of my presentation, first I'm going to talk to you about a case uh, in The Hague. Next, the, the risk-based approach that followed on this case, some of the guidelines we made, about this risk-based approach and, and at last the road to le legislation. Now, and the case that triggered the, the problems we encounter at the fire brigade around battery energy storage systems uh, within the Netherlands was the, uh, the best which was placed near the football stadium of Ado de Hague at the end of 2017 and the beginning of 2018. And the problem that uh, the regional fire brigade encountered was there was almost no regulation about battery energy storage systems. Also, they encountered that there was uh, no knowledge about the risks of a BES, let alone about risk mitigating measures. Also, they encountered a deadline of two weeks to bring their advisors of fire brigade to the authority about the permit of the energy storage system, in this case, the municipality. Um, and what happened was an action plan by the fire brigade of the Hague, and they called in assistance from colleagues from other fire brigades that had more knowledge about battery safety. For example, the fire brigade of Rotterdam, which encountered batteries in their harbor. Also, a company visit was conducted by the fire brigade to learn more about the system which was placed near the football stadium. Um, and what was notable, according to my colleague Sander, is that when they conducted that company visit, um, the company had that at that point in time, end of 2017 to the beginning of 2018, no knowledge of possible incident scenarios which could occur with a battery energy storage system. Um, as there is no legislation, the advice had therefore to, had to be risk based. It had to be based on the knowledge of risks and the possible incident scenarios instead of that it was built on legislation on regulation, the theory on which you normally build an advice as a fire brigade. However, the case in The Hague was not the only problem. As we saw in the, in the presentation of uh, Maarten and Stefan, we see an increasing number of, en number of energy storage systems within the Netherlands and even around the world. This means that at that point in time, the advisement of, about these systems was a reoccurring problem for several fire brigades in the, within the Netherlands. To come on a uniform way of advising as, a far, as the different fire brigades, the different brigades bundled forces and started to make their own guidelines. Some examples you can see here on the right. It are, for example, uh, guidelines about small energy storage systems at home, uh, which are smaller than 20 kilowatt hours, we say here. We have for the larger energy storage systems for more than 20 kilowatt hours, we have our guidelines. And we have special guidelines when it comes to the energy storage systems 
on the rooftops of buildings and, and office blocks. As on rooftops, the risk become even more complex and the mitigation of risk even is becoming also more complex. Uh, the fire brigade bundled forces with the Dutch Institute for Safety, for which I work, when it comes to making these guidelines and spreading them across the country to other fire brigades, but also to municipalities. However, one of the problems at hand with these guidelines is that these guidelines are no regulation or any form of legislation. There are, are advices that the fire brigade could give. However, municipalities are in some cases not bounded to follow these advices, which can increase the risk of such a system. Now, a small sidestep, what are these uh, advices that we give about energy storage systems? I will briefly go to the most important important of them. They, they, these guidelines contain advices about fire propagations or the, the propagation of a thermal runaway. Um, when we look at fire propagation, we say that an external fire should at least in the first 60 minutes not enter a battery, battery energy storage system. Also, we give advices about the propagation of a thermal runaway within the different battery modules. The guidelines also contain some advices about the ventilation principles to prevent a form of explosion. Mattery and Matthew will later on talk about some examples and the risks of these explosions in battery energy storage systems. Also, the advisors have the purpose to shorten the intervention time of the fire brigade. This can either be done by placing an extinguishing system in the energy storage system or placing a fire connector. And with the fire connector, a fire hose can be attached and the battery energy storage system can be filled up with water as a last resource to mitigate the incident because all batteries have been drained with water. Also, we advise 24 7 monitoring and controlling of the energy storage system. With this way, a malfunction or defect within the system can be detected at an early stage in time and therefore the battery can be removed from the system before it can go into thermal runaway. As these energy storage systems are often placed in sea containers, and we also give some recommendations about the recognizability of those systems. Uh, a, a battery energy storage system should be recognizable from the outside for the fire brigade, that in case they are con confronted with a fire in a container, they can easily see that it is a battery energy storage system instead of a container filled, filled with, for example, furniture. Now, the fire brigade made those guidelines and uh, we had some luck that the, the Dutch government noticed the issue at hand, that there was no legislation about these energy storage systems. Um, therefore, they started to make what, what we call in Dutch the circulaire risico beheersing or a circular letter in English about, about energy storage systems, but also about the storage of a of large number of batteries. For example, as the storage of large number of e-bike batteries. Now, several organizations are involved in the making of such regulations. These are ministries, industry, local government, fire departments and other relevant parties. For example, the insurance companies. This circular letter was completed in one year and was published uh, around uh, half of 2020. And this circular letter can be seen as a form of a gentleman agreement. It is not legislation in the form of a law, but all parties involved in this circular letter are agreeing on that this is the standard. Also, they started to work on the, the publicatie reeks gevaarlijke stoffen, as we call it in Dutch, or the best practical techniques. And the circular letter was tried to make a connection with the, with the best practical technique, which we'll, which are working on now. So there was no gap between those two. Uh, that brings us to the current situation in which we are in the Netherlands right now. The regulation in the form of the circular letter is getting more and more common, but we're noticing, noticing that still not everybody is involved about the existence of the circular letter. This can either be municipalities which aren't aware of it, but also be battery energy storage systems manufacturers which haven't heard of it. Also, we see that the circular letter is based on only certain types of batteries, but more and safer types of batteries are coming onto the market. This can lead to the the problem that some municipalities or fire brigades, uh, given our advice, take the, the less safer batteries and the risks involved in them in their advice. But the battery energy storage system is already safer than the fire brigade thinks, which can give some friction in the 
in the advisement procedure. Next to that, the, we are working on a, the, the best practical technique, which is based on one typical and several delta typicals. And to explain this, a typical is the most common form of an installation, and the delta typicals are other less common forms of the battery energy storage installations. And by working with those typicals and delta typicals, the pro we try to incorporate of as much type of batteries and different type of batteries within the new regulation, so that the problem that only a worst case scenario with uh, bad quality batteries is being involved. Our bad, bad quality is maybe the wrong word, but less safer batteries is tackled. Uh, when looking at the future, there will be an evaluation of the current regulations or the circular ladder in the Netherlands. Uh, are, are companies, municipalities, fire brigades following the advices which are given in the circular ladder? And how can we even more improve it? Next to that, as already was presented in the previous presentations, new, better or safer batteries are coming into, into the market. Uh, this also means for, for us as a fire brigade and as a knowledge institute, we have to think about these new types of batteries and adjust our advices and the batteries are becoming more and more safer. So measurements have to have to be less, um, yeah, less hard. Uh, for example, if the batteries are safer, the option of filling up a complete container is maybe not more necessary. Also, what we see is the combination of battery energy storage systems combined with, for example, hydrogen installations which are placed next to it. These bring some combinational risks into play, which can cause additional risks for the environment. So we have to look into the, the possible incident scenarios that those combinational risks can cause. Um, this was in a brief nutshell, the situation in the Netherlands in which we encountered, in which we had no regulation at all about battery storage, in which we as a fire brigade made our own guidelines to come to a, the, the best safe situation possible at that point in time. And uh, the, we are now on the road to legislation. And I think this is a typical example of the energy transition in which the techniques are moving more faster uh, than legislation is going. And as a fire brigade, we're in between those two parties. We have to adjust to the new techniques at hand, but we don't have the backup of theory and legislation to work on it. Fortunately, we're also seeing that on a European level, codes and standards are being made. But Rianne Uthoen from DNV will talk about that in her presentation after the break. Um, that brings me to the last slide. Niels, are there any questions? Yes, Tom. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, give you a great uh, thanks for uh, introducing us in these guidelines that you uh, formulated for uh, battery energy storage systems uh, in the built environment. Uh, I know the harsh work that you uh, conducted to, to reach that guideline. And uh, secondly, uh, I think it's really uh, uh, necessary to also thank you for producing this afternoon. Some of us know that, but most of the people who are attending this, uh, this, this conference, they do not know that you are the, the man behind the behind the, the screen that produces this meeting. So thank you very much for that. Tom, I'm, uh, looking, uh, I'm looking at the, at, the, at the questions. I don't see them, but I do have a question myself. You said the, the energy storage systems are uh, evolving. They are getting more and more safe. And as we look at the, the presentation just before you from uh, Stefan and Martin, they introduce also new kinds of energy storage uh, concepts, like for example, ammonia, hydrogen, uh, steady state and uh, solid, uh, solid state batteries. So do you have already a clue about the safety issues of those batteries or is it future research? How do you look at those uh, new kind of energy storage systems that are uh, in the near future uh, coming, uh, coming to us? As we as we know, hydrogen and uh, and ammonia are uh, are known gases within our uh, for our fire brigade. So I think we have to adjust. We already have some procedures on it, but we have to uh, get more common with those procedures, as the 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 ammonia and hydrogen are now most of the times only be seen in the the heavy industry or in har in harbors or in industry compounds, and getting more and more 
now we're getting used in our daily society. So more and more fire brigades are confronted with it and therefore we should train our colleagues more and better in these procedures. Um, and with the solid state batteries, uh, I, th I think the risks are becoming, are decreasing. However, we should look into the risks of those specific systems. But uh, that, that for that, for me, that's future research. All right, thank you. And we have another question from uh, from our colleague from the United States, Matthew. Matthew Pace, he asked, are the Netherlands considering adopting the NFPA 855 uh, as a standard? Uh, I don't know whether you are uh, into the, the NFPA code, but do you have uh, ideas on that? I know that uh, the PGS Commission is looking into uh, adapting some of the guidelines from, of, from the NFPA 855 into the new PGS 37. So they are looking into it. Great, and maybe Matthew, when you are uh, presenting your work, maybe you can give us some hints uh, regarding the NFPA 855, what we at least should take into account when uh, developing our own uh, guidelines. So this concludes the, the, the second part of the UE uh, Energy Storage uh, System Safety Conference. And uh, I would like to, to introduce this short break. I uh, propose to, to be back at uh, 10 minutes uh, part three in order to, uh, to join the, the presentation from uh, Rianne Thun from uh, DMV. So we have a short break for 10 minutes and hopefully I will see you back in uh, in 10 minutes, uh, 10 minutes part three. So see you soon. Hi there, everyone. Uh, still great to see that uh, over a hundred of people are uh, still attending uh, our uh, our conference on uh, the safety aspects of uh, energy storage systems. That's a great amount of uh, people, but even uh, even even more interesting is the quality of the the contributions that we we bring to you. Uh, and our next speaker, she's from uh, DMV, the Netherlands. It's uh, Rihanna Thun, and uh, Rihanna is an is an expert in uh, in battery uh, storage and battery storage safety. And she will uh, introduce her activities and the code activities that they are performing at DMV. So, Rihanna, would you please uh, take the floor and introduce us in your work, and uh, hopefully also in the results and uh, opportunities for standardization in uh, in codes. Yes, of course. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Niels. Um, well, thank you also for organizing uh, today and for me being able to present today. I'm really excited that we were able to organize uh, this conference, um, even though uh, it is not face to face. But let's hope that we can do a next year edition so where we can actually meet and discuss. Um, so I will uh, talk about uh, the land based energy storage systems and the safety standards and regulations um, and relate, let's say, the Dutch regulations where Tom just mentioned uh, to the international standards that are in development. Um, so I'm Rianne, I work at DNV in the energy storage team. <coughs> uh, we typically do a technical review, due diligence work, technical advice <coughs> um, and uh, assess new energy technologies. Uh, and here we have a special focus on safety because safety is one of the most important things when um, you're discussing uh, storage systems. In, in the next 50 minutes, I'll tell you more about the storage systems, the permitting and regulation and uh, the safety aspects of it. Um, for who's not familiar uh, with uh, DMV, DMV is a quality uh, assurance and risk management company, an international one. Um, and as mentioned, I'm located in the energy storage system uh, department <coughs> where we work on energy storage um, of land based systems, so the grid connected systems and the uh, EVs, um, uh, grid connection, etc. Uh, but we collaborate a lot with the maritime industry. Um, that's uh, our department that has a lot of experience with um, <coughs> batteries on ships and in the maritime sector and as you can imagine the safety question is really important in the maritime industry as well so here you see that the same battery components is used in different industries and it's really important to make sure to to align and uh, learn lessons from each other 
Um, so uh, let me just quickly give you some background of why safety is so important. Eh? So touch upon the energy transition. <coughs> then uh, look at the safety aspects, discuss uh, standards and regulation and uh, give you a short summary. Uh, so why is uh, battery storage safety so important? Well, first of all, we have the decarbonization. So we have a, an enormous deployment of wind and solar, as you can see here. And um, this uh, will ask um, uh, uh, for matching the flexibility. Uh, so matching the use and demand as uh, Stefan uh, from SNL uh, was discussing about. On the other hand, we have the electrification of transport. Uh, as Stefan mentioned, this is basically driving um, the cost rundown of the battery systems. It also increases the ask for, electri for electricity. And the same holds for the electrification of heat. So uh, with this, um, we have an increased amount of uh, electricity need and we have an increased problem uh, with matching uh, um, demand and supply. And that's when energy uh, storage system can provide us with a solution. Uh, energy storage systems are already deployed for some time, but relatively new to the electricity um, uh, area. So what's the challenge here? Every energy storage system, whatever you use, if it would be uh, a container full with batteries, but also if it, these are uh, power dams or other ways, uh, hydropower or other ways to store, your energy inherently they contain high energy density and inherently there is a risk that all of this can be released uncontrolled. Uh, so basically this is a risk that you need to manage and you need to think about um, and it can be managed um, if you think about it carefully. Uh, so what are the risks then? Eh? So uh, South Korea has already mentioned 4% of the installed capacity was lost. Um, we have the Arizona uh, incidents that will be discussed uh, uh, later today in more detail, uh, but where there was an explosion and uh, also in the EU, there's now um, increased concern of the safety uh, as a result of the Liverpool incident last uh, September. There was both an explosion and fire uh, where one of those three containers was completely lost. So uh, we just discussed and uh, we had Martin asking a question about what's the definition of a thermal runaway. And I think that's a really important question, also something to be very uh, aware about. So what is a thermal runaway? Um, first of all, uh, this is what most of you know. There's more heat prediction, there's temperature increase, it accelerates the chemical reaction. Um, and uh, this is an external ex exothermic reaction. And with this, it's a self-fulfilling, a self-reinforcing effect. Um, which cannot be controlled. So it's an uncontrolled uh, mechanism. In the early stage of a uh, thermal runaway, it's just a decomposition. So this is uh, how a cells look like. I'm not sure if you can see my pointer. Uh, pointer options. Um, so this is um, uh, how a um, uh, cylindrical cell looks like. Here you see the cathode, the separator in between and the, the anode. And um, there's a, a solid electrolyte interface between um, uh, uh, here and um, what happens in the first phase uh, of a thermal runaway, so around 60 to 90 degrees, then uh, you have the solid electrolyte interface uh, layer decomposing. This is an external, external reaction, so heat is released, but it's still controllable. So if at that moment you kick in with proper cooling and um, uh, it's still possible to mitigate uh, the incident, um, um, unfortunately, so you can cool down and you can stop the reaction. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the AI, so the solid electrolyte interface, a decomposition is a unreversible process. So uh, you should consider um, your battery as being lost. And this is also why, as an indication eh, for, for this kind of um, fire propagation test, um, when a, a part of the system where the batteries is above this 80 degrees or 85 degrees Celsius, you should not use your uh, battery again. You should consider it as being lost um, uh, because your battery is damaged. 
Um, this is, by the way, for a typical NMC battery, this is important to, to uh, so a typical lithium ion battery uh, with co cobalt and manganese as is typically used in the market currently. Um, then in the second phase, it's um, uh, the interaction between the electrolyte and the anode. This is around 260 degrees or 200 degrees. And in the third phase, it's the cathode reaction with the electrolyte. And that's when we really go into thermal runaway, which is an uncontrollable and unstoppable reaction. And then we get the intense fire um, that I can actually uh, show you here. This is an example. I need to end the pointer in order to be able to start the movie. Um, so here you can see um, um, an experiment with four pouch cells. This is in total, these to four pouch cells in total uh, are about 250, 300 watt hours. So it's a typical, um, it's a typical um, um, uh, amount of energy that you would have on a, a bicycle battery, but it's one of the components in a in a module of a, a grid uh, connected storage system. So here you see first the pouch cell blowing up. Um, this is when the gas is released inside, and at some point um, it uh, the pouch cell breaks open, the gas is released, and uh, then later um, ah, we just missed the moment. <laughs> Here you see the gas and then you see it uh, being um, set on fire. Um, uh, and so uh, we also discussed before that uh, we step into a car. Uh, Roland mentioned this. We step into a car <laughs> uh, and we, uh, although uh, there's a lot of um, petrol in it, uh, uh, we completely accept it. It's also a way of energy storage. Uh, but the difference is that we know we are familiar with the risks that are with gasoline. We know you should not smoke a cigarette at a, a petrol station. Uh, and this unknown, this new part of, of storage system, that is the challenging part here. Um, so uh, there's a specific safety window, uh, which we already discussed, so I quickly run through. So we have the causes, the internal failures and external abuse. So medical, mechanical abuse, dropping it, uh, electrical abuse, overcharging, kind of things, external fires or failures in cooling. So the thermal abuse uh, that can start a thermal runaway and where you can uh, include multiple safeguards in your safety strategy or it can be internal failures, uh, um, um, uh, which are uh, in the uh, production process uh, integrated. It's uh, the dendrites or particles can be in there, uh, and these can also uh, cause shortcuts and then a thermal runaway. Um, so uh, the effect then is uh, uh, the toxic gases uh, and heat and explosion risk, um, and there it's important uh, to use the knowledge of the UL94A test description to construct um, uh, uh, a safety strategy that is in line with all the components uh, of your system. So a holistic uh, approach, approach in where you look at the system uh, as, a, as a whole and um, uh, all individual components as, as part of it is important there. And um, uh, yeah, typical standards describe all standard way to avoid the incident and uh, to mitigate the effect. Um, so uh, yes, there is indeed a balance between um, uh, increasing the valid ventilation and close. So, so between the explosion risk and the fire risk. Uh, on one hand, um, if uh, uh, there's an enormous uh, uh, fire, huh? um, uh, if we increase the ventilation, the oxygen is increased and uh, there are a lot of hazardous gases uh, released here. So we have a, a, a huge fire. On the other hand, if we limit the fire by limiting the oxygen, the hazardous gases can accumulate and um, uh, you get the explosion risk. So in your safety strategy, you need to balance between the two. You need to think about uh, how to design uh, your system. Um, we therefore have the Accumulate Project. It's a subsidized project from the European Union, uh, from the European Regional Development Fund. And uh, the goal is safe integration and application of uh, battery technologies. We're in this project together with um, uh, Twente Safety Campus. 
So together we take the initiative uh, to build uh, a test lab where we can actually perform those fire propagation tests. Um, then there's the University of Twente, um, who is looking at the operational performance um, and providing us also with technical uh, knowledge. Uh, and there are a number of industry uh, parties. So we have Brecker and uh, Van Raam uh, working on the, the, the electrical mobility and electrical motors, uh, Contour, uh, a system integrator for storage system and Hankom. Uh, uh, for example, um, developing trucks for uh, lift trucks or um, electrical vehicles uh, for mining, that uh, it's important to look at the whole chain of from the battery pack um, assembly to the reuse and, and recycling. Um, so so uh, to make the step from the safety aspect now, how to translate this in standard and regulation? Well, first of all, it's uh, uh, using a standard. It's important to realize that using a standard is a way to ensure safety. Um, however, as is mentioned, it's typically um, um, an, 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 um, a set of regulations. So, uh, sorry, a, a set of um, um, uh, best known available knowledge uh, at that moment in time. What do I mean with that? Um, uh, technology developments and es especially within battery energy storage, new, new technologies uh, become available, new chemistries are integrated and they might affect the safety measures that you need or want to take um, in your system. So this means that standards and regulation will always run behind the new best um, methods uh, with the highest energy densities. So even when you're using a standard, please don't take it just as a checklist, but always be aware of what you're doing and think about the interpretation and the intention of such a standard. And then next, if you're working with standards, which is important to realize is that standards uh, are always an agreement between the stakeholders involved about a product, a service or a system, and it reflects a consensus. So it's not, let's say, one single way of doing, but it's a consensus between the parties involved. And uh, indeed, it's not uh, directly um, uh, mandatory or regulation, but it needs to be adopted. Uh, either it can be either adopted by industry, um, so people can ask for it, or industry can typically refer to it, or it, or it can be enforced by the authority. Um, so that is when it's referred to into regulation. So, for example, when the new PTS protocol dangerous goods. Um, in the Netherlands would be developed, then uh, it can refer to the different NFPA standards, uh, NFPA 855 or an IEC standards or a DOL, or it can just take over clauses or parts from there. Um, the challenge, therefore, in writing a proper standard is always to write it in a functional way um, so that as long as the project is, is still maturing, um, uh, a regulation also don't limit, let's say, the, the development, but safety should also always be uh, at, at number one here. Um, and um, there is a risk of not limited clarity about regulation. And that's what we currently see uh, within the European Union. There's a lot of local variation. So that is a really good initiative in the Netherlands that uh, we try to make national regulations now before it was really locally organized um, within the different regions. Um, there is a risk that regulation might change so that at a later uh, moment in time you need to make adjustments to your battery storage system, which is really expensive uh, uh, exercise. And there's a risk of overreaction in case of an incident, because if there would be an incident and we're not capable of distinguishing the good from the bad systems, uh, we would uh, the, the, the public perception uh, changes, uh, which we definitely want to avoid. So it's in um, uh, the advantage of all of us um, to be open about safety, to be clear about safety and to assure safety of the storage system. Um, uh, so we worry about the grid connection and the impact that it has on the grid and we uh, worry about the environment, so people, safety and health, of course. Um, talking about safety, there are a lot of uh, aspects that, that should be considered. So there are a lot of other standards specifically for EMC or for the electrical part, uh, for co specific components in your system. 
Um, and uh, also on the cybersecurity aspect, it's really important to, to ensure the safety of your system. Um, here, if you want to, uh, when focusing on uh, uh, the, the system level, um, uh, the US has a lot of experience and development already in the NFPA 855, um, which is um, uh, already discussed uh, um, uh, before today. Um, and um, uh, the, oh, sorry, can you still see my presentation? Um, which is already uh, being discussed today in the UL 9540. Uh, which um, uh, covers, uh, so the 9540A is really the, the, the test to check what happened as it fails to provide input in designing your system in a correct way. And your 9540 covers uh, the safety of the whole system. Um, the equivalent uh, of, of that one um, to the European standard is the 6293352, which is, um, became effective last year April, if I'm correct. Um, this one is um, the the safety describes the safety requirements for grid integrated energy storage systems, uh, electrical chemical based. So it's it's narrower than the UL95. Uh, the UL95 also describes the flywheel and other uh, flow battery uh, technologies. So uh, 6293 is a little bit more limited. This one is really an application standard. So it looks in how the system is in use. Well, uh, the 62619, which is a safety requirement for the batteries that are used in um, the environmental, uh, sorry, that are used in uh, a system. So they are uh, in use for uh, industrial applications. So um, uh, talking about the, the systems that we are discussing, we really need to look at the, the system level. The operational safety is covered in the uh, uh, 62485, which is um, the safe operation of stationary lithium ion batteries. Um, and uh, also that one has, again, a Dutch translation um, to it. Um, so in the uh, European Union, uh, a lot is happening uh, on the uh, harmonizing of standards in the directive. Previously, the current situation is um, oh. um, uh, so uh, it used to be a battery directive, uh, but it's now translated into a battery uh, regulation on European level. Uh, so what's the difference between the two um, and what's the background? Well, um, uh, the, the proposal of the new battery regulation has a strong focus on reuse and recyclability. It promotes a circular um, economy and um, a focus on reducing the social environmental impact. And um, um, uh, a regulation is, uh, um, a directive is non-binding, so it sets a goal, while the regulation is directly applicable uh, for each member country and should be implemented uh, directly. So it's important um, uh, because uh, uh, absence of the complete set of rules for batteries placed on the market so for the industry, it's best if there's clarity and if the rules are the same for everyone. Um, uh, so it's really important that the uh, EU um, also aligns uh, with the Dutch committees uh, on uh, and build uh, upon the knowledge uh, that is there. Oh, the, oh almost there, um, and to avoid the uneven implementation of obligations across the EU member states, states so that there is no uh, barriers to the function of uh, recycling market. So there's a focus on the Green Deal, um, there's a harmonized product requirements, and it provides legal certainty to unlock investments, um, uh, which is really important to unlock also uh, the, the storage system industry. Um, there is a, a part of it is the intention to um, harmonize standards uh, related to performance, safety and sustainability. So the current standards uh, th that I just mentioned, the 62933, are uh, a standard that um, uh, is not uh, uh, binded by, by legislation yet. But this initiative, if it's a harmonized standard, uh, it's a binding legal um, document. Um, so the Senelec, the European Standardization Committee, 
will um, work on the standards, but it will still be an uh, implementation time of expected to be about three years before the final um, are available. So until that time, um, uh, just the local regulations uh, will uh, apply. Other things are important are the safety instruction on how to handle the waste batteries and the to technical documentation to demonstrate safety. Uh, so uh, to summary, summarize everything. Uh, first of all, it's important to realize that the battery energy storage uh, system will become an essential building block to the energy transition. So that means that we we need the storage systems and we we need to ensure safety uh, because else the whole energy transition uh, um, uh, will be delayed. Um, new technologies will be in development. It will still be rapid technology development, so it's important to keep up to date with all the new, safer uh, and better performing uh, batteries. The challenge of the system is the system safety and for this a whole the whole system safety. So for this, you need a holistic approach, a whole system st strategy and multiple level levels of safety to avoid uh, any incident to escalate into a major event. Uh, incidents will affect all, so it's really important to share and learn from incidents and continuously improve. Um, and a lack of regulation and standards is a risk for successful deployment of the best. Uh, so I'm really happy to see the PGS being implemented soon. And um, yeah, always um, be aware of what you're doing and don't see uh, standards as a checklist because um, uh, um, standards will not be able to keep up with all the developments. So apply the best practices. Thank you very much. Um, I have no clue where I'm in time, uh, Niels. Uh, I, do. Sure if... I do, I ah, do. Perfect. <laughs> uh, Rihanna, thank you very much. Uh, you ran a little bit out of time. So what I propose is we have three uh, uh, questions or remarks in the chat. We will uh, answer them uh, also in the chat. So we, uh, we uh, do a little bit of speeding up. So I would like to, uh, to continue with the, with the next speaker and this, uh, the next speaker. It's a great honor for me to, uh, to introduce the next speaker. He's one of the, let's say, the, the founders of this cooperation between the United States of America and, and Europe for uh, exchanging knowledge regarding energy storage systems. Our next speaker is uh, Matthew Pace and uh, Matthew is a technical advisor in the Battery Materials uh, Systems Group of uh, PNL. And uh, Matthew, would you like uh, to, to start your presentation and uh, give us some, uh, some great insights in the safety uh, issues and uh, experience you have uh, so please go ahead. Thank you, Nils. Uh, can you hear me and see my presentation yet? I can hear you very clear and I can see your presentation. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody else. Um, uh, as Nils mentioned, uh, I do lead the energy storage safety codes and standards efforts for Pacific Northwest National Labs. Uh, but like Sean, um, I actually came from the fire service. I spent 23 years uh, with the San Jose Fire Department in California. And uh, so I, I understand what a lot of you uh, are facing in responding to energy storage uh, system events. And so I try and apply my background to some of the solutions uh, with codes and standards. I represent PNNL on a number of different codes and standards. We heard Rihanna talk about IEC 62933. I am a national or a US representative on that. I also am a, am a technical committee member on NFPA 855, um, as well as I sit on UL 9540. So we have a voice on each of those standards and uh, each of those are represented by a variety of stakeholders. Anyways, this presentation, um, I was really hoping to try and give you some real life incidents and what we've learned from them. Um, and also we'll be talking a little bit about the explosion risk because that really is the most significant risk um, with lithium ion technology. And it's really important to understand that there are a number of different chemistries and technologies, but the predominant chemistry um, in the industry today is lithium ion and understanding the risks and designing to them really is the key. So what I'm going to start with is the first incident, uh, which 
uh, was the uh, air We have lost your video, your audio. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, I do hear you, Matthew. OK, sorry about that. No problem. Uh, so this incident occurred at a utility substation in Arizona in April of 2019, and it was reported by somebody driving by. The actual uh, smoke alarm inside that triggered the clean agent discharge uh, was not reported to the fire department by the monitoring senator center. So there was a, a significant delay. And what I'm going to show you is a little bit of a timeline of what occurred. So 430 in the afternoon is when the smoke detector triggered the fire in one of the battery racks and released the clean agent. Um, but as I said, there was a delay in the notification of the fire department. And so it was over an hour later that somebody called uh, 911 is our phone number for emergency response. Fire department showed up just about seven minutes after that. And uh, when they arrived on scene, they knew that it was a battery installation at the substation. There was a technician on scene um, and they upgraded the event to a hazmat uh, uh, incident and that dispatched the local hazmat units. However, they are comprised of members from uh, uh, several different fire departments in the area. When they arrived on scene, they uh, proceeded to do a lot of gas monitoring outside and were picking up high readings of hydrogen cyanide. There was no active smoke or fire present. Um, and at about eight o'clock, so over three hours after the original fire, the utility was interested in having the building turned back over to them and the um, hazmat crew wanted to verify there was no, no significant amounts of heat or other gases um, prior to turning the building over. So when they opened the door to get some readings, um, it exploded. The explosion significantly hurt two firefighters but sent a number of them to the hospital. This first image is the position of a hose line that was protecting the crews that were uh, opening the door. Um, there was smoke that was coming out of these uh, pad mounted uh, electrical enclosures and uh, it had leaked through conduit fittings and was just coming through there. This is an image of the, uh, the fence about 20 feet away from the enclosure um, and here's some fire damage after the explosion. This image right here is the metal man door that previously was on the front of the uh, enclosure. At the explosion, the force of the explosion deformed this door and threw the two firefighters up against the fence underneath it and then some distance away. You can see at the fence line, um, pieces of their uh, SCBA, their breathing apparatus, um, a hood, torn off of them as they were thrown underneath the fence. They landed approximately 50 feet away from the fence, so it was a total of about 75 feet, um, maybe about 30 meters away, um, and all that was seen was just a ball of fire, and the firefighter that was on this hose line turned around to put the fire out, not knowing that that's where uh, uh, one of the members was, was laying, and a piece of their breathing apparatus in that location. So when I saw these photos myself, um, my immediate thought was the pressure wave that was involved in this explosion was had a very, very high flame speed, and uh, that's indicative of a high hydrogen content explosion. So this was a very significant incident, and it really was uh, pretty much the bellwether event for safety because it was the first known explosion. Uh, since then, we've had a number of fires um, in South Korea. And we've also started to see some incidents with the residential batteries. And this was one incident that occurred in California. And uh, these series of photos, this this overhead right here shows, you know, Google image of the house. And um, on the rear of the house, um, there is a stairway that goes down right here 
the stairway, when you reach the bottom of the stairs and turn around, you're looking at this fence. This fence goes into this parking area. So just to give you a, uh, an idea, this deck that is in the upper left corner here is a, a deck off of the house. And the battery is mounted on the exterior wall of the house um, uh, right there. Here's the location of the battery and the solar inverter. Uh, this is a uh, lithium ion battery, residential battery was installed in January of 2019. The PV system was installed a couple years before that, but it was upgraded at the time that the battery was installed. It was installed uh, as a permitted installation, inspected and all to code. Uh, the fire department was called about one o'clock in the afternoon and uh, the homeowner's son was uh, at home visiting uh, with some friends when they heard uh, a buzzing sound and the lights had gone off. This is the location of the battery fire. And uh, this, this particular uh, battery, uh, at this time it was not listed to UL 9540. And there's a bit of a problem right now with the versions of 9540. Right now we're on the second edition of 9540. And um, the first edition 9540 did not require the, that the residential batteries go through the 9540A fire testing that Sean had explained earlier. The second edition of 9540 that has been out for about a year now does require that all wall mounted residential units go through that fire testing. And so it's really a function of the code that is adopted and you know, which one is referenced. But nevertheless, this is a uh, considered a gap in the residential market. And uh, so this battery here was used for load shifting, which means that once a day it was discharging the battery during uh, expensive times of the day and uh, then recharging at night. Some additional photos of the fire damage show that the location of the most heat is down here in the bottom. Um, but when you look at this picture right here, this is the mounting rack for the battery, the fire penetrating the actual wall uh, um, siding and uh, ran up into the, uh, um, the rafter joists, uh, joist area here. So this very, easily could have burnt this house down if somebody was not home. And lastly, here's a picture. There was a installer that came and pulled it off and put it inside a plastic kind of a fish basin here. So the cause of the failure is not known. Uh, it's very likely we will not know this, um, but the bottom line is that this is a problem. There have been um, upwards of a dozen fires in residential units. So this is of great concern. Uh, to the entire industry. So definitely something to be aware of. For the responders that are on this conference, the best practice is to protect the exposure, um, apply water. It's very difficult to put out a cell that's gone under thermal runaway. And because of the casing around here, even directing a hose stream would have a limited effect. So a recommendation is to you know, protect the exposure. Again, this is an outdoor installation, so the ventilation is provided. Um, but indoor installations, explosion risk is significant. So now let's go back to another larger installation. We had heard mention of this earlier uh, this afternoon. This is an incident that occurred at a substation in Liverpool. Um, this occurred at uh, around 11 p.m. and it was operated by a utility in Denmark. Here's an image of the actual enclosure that experienced the explosion and fire. And uh, the there was no notification to the fire department prior to the explosion. So we don't know how long of a delay there was. Uh, this system right here uh, was not required to include any um, uh, fire suppression or um, I'm sorry, any uh, deflagration venting. Deflagration venting are essentially blowout panels that direct any pressure wave in a certain direction. These holes in the top of this enclosure were actually where the uh, HVAC units laying down here on the side were tossed off. So no deflagration venting. There was a clean agent system present. Um, the fire department's actions were really focused on protecting the exposures because when they got there, there was fire fully involved in this container 
And uh, so they were protecting the inverters and then the neighboring container there. Again, these comments here are based on just a fire department response report, not a fire cause investigation, which is still underway. Some images from the evening of the firefight. Uh, again, their ability to access water, they had to bend the fence posts just to get the water streams into this only open door. So it was very limited. It was a very significantly extended operation. Uh, they had fire and um, you know, reignitions for 59 hours. The explosion uh, threw debris from six to 20 meters away. And uh, so in some ways, it was probably a good thing that the fire department showed up after the explosion um, because it, had they put themselves closer, it could have been much more significant. So some of the key gaps that were identified um, were that no training was provided to the fire department at the time the system was installed. Um, as I mentioned, there was no communication from the operator that the system was uh, in alarm mode. Um, they focused a lot on hazmat monitoring of both airborne and water runoff for the entire event. They did not find any low pH um, runoff. The site had a lot of lime in it, and so it's believed that that buffered any acidic runoff. Um, most of the pHs were a little bit high. Um, but due to the continued uh, you know, fire, this was a very prolonged event. So that's a significant concern for sites that have to constrain their water runoff or your water supply. So definitely uh, an issue there needs to be addressed. So recommendations, provide pre-plans and a risk assessment. Uh, as part of the design. They acknowledge that there was no deflagration prevention or venting on there. Um, introduce separators underneath the site to contain, contain water fire runoff. I am not sure that you could contain 59 hours of those kinds of flows. Um, have in rack fire suppression as an external system may not penetrate the racks. We are starting to see some manufacturers put water suppression and other agents uh, inside the actual module. So that has some promising um, uh, benefits, I do believe, moving forward. Um, external markings on the containers to notify crews where a lance or stinger can be used without damaging the cells. Um, this is also referred to as a piercing nozzle. Um, my personal opinion is you might be a little too close if you're taking those kinds of actions there. Um, this equipment is really written off by the system owner uh, they're not going to be brushing off the um, carbon soot and then turning it back on. So the real goal is life safety and prevent, uh, uh, you know, um, extension to other units. Um, external audible or visual warning to uh, let you know what's what's triggered or what's activated. That's a great point right there. Uh, remote activation of the suppression system so the monitoring station can activate. Um, you know, it really should be automatic. Um, someone that's remote can't, they don't have eyes on the situation, so I'm, I, I'm not sure that I would support uh, remote activation. Um, and then blast walls across each entr entrance to reduce the blast risk. Um, this is definitely a viable option when you have a siting issue next to other uh, critical facilities. So what we've learned here is that reducing the explosion risk is the key gap. Rihanna had a really good slide where she showed that you are, you're balancing two different issues, either a fire risk or an explosion risk. And one thing about fire is it's really effective at consuming flammable gases. And with lithium ion, um, there really is no uh, highly effective fire suppression system. Um, the clean agents are very effective at visible flame, but they're not uh, shown to be effective at deep seated thermal runaway fires. So um, we've seen uh, thermal runaway that produces a lot of flammable gases and no fire to put out. So those gases are continuing to be produced. So we really feel that the explosion risk is the greatest risk. And this is a recent um, fire in uh, South Korea. There was clearly an explosion that occurred here. So we really feel that this is something that's important to address. So at PNNL, one of the uh, efforts we've undertaken um, uh, with the support of the Department of Energy's Office of Electricity is to come up with a solution. 
And we've called this IntelliVent, and this is a solution for an explosion reduction system. We've already mentioned a couple of these incidents that the lack of exhaust ventilation, it was the leading gap in the Arizona incident. Um, and other explosions will occur in similar design systems. There are many installed. Um, and this deflagration prevention is a term in the NFPA 855 code as one of the ways of addressing explosion control. Either you can have the blowout vents or deflagration prevention means an exhaust system, an air dilution system, get rid of the flammable gases. And a listing to UL 9540 uh, is a very costly endeavor uh, for a large one-off system because you have to do fire testing and you're not going to destroy the one device that you're installing. So the industry is moving towards a more modularized approach. Um, so again, when you provide deflagration venting, the blow up panel, it's a late stage measure. The explosion has already occurred, so it doesn't eliminate the flammable gases prior to the explosion. So we really feel that preventing that explosion really is the key. And as these systems are moving more towards a cabinet design, in other words, you access from the exterior and there's a lot more batteries inside, there's even less free air volume uh, to ventilate. So it's going to become even more challenging. It has to happen uh, more rapidly. There's a couple of tests that UL did uh, that Sean had shown some of. Uh, the link I put in the uh, Q&A down below, this is a 154 page report. <laughs> so if you suffer from insomnia, this is a good solution, but it's really an amazing study uh, that UL conducted with uh, um, trying to evaluate the effectiveness of a couple different fire uh, suppression agents. This first demonstration test was using a clean agent system. And what we see here, these different timelines, is the smoke accumulation. And very quickly, because a smoke detector picks up smoke, the clean agent was discharged. Uh, clean agents have a certain soak time or an ability to maintain a concentration in a space. But after about um, 25, you know, 26 minutes, we start to see some uh, ignition again. And thermal runaway continues even after the clean agent discharge. Um, that ends up resulting in a partial volume deflagration after about 20 more minutes and continued thermal runaway. Uh, at some point after about two hours, they uh, had to uh, terminate the event and they opened the door and had some flash over. So in this uh, demonstration, you, you had thermal runaway, you had deflagration. In the next demonstration, they're actually using a water suppression system and uh, that is triggered by uh, um, smoke and heat. And uh, so, I'm sorry, it's triggered by heat because there's a fire sprinkler in there, so it's got a bulb that has to hit. So there's a little bit of a delay from the onset of thermal runaway to the sprinkler head uh, discharging, about eight minutes. Water flow at 0.5 gallons per minute per square foot. It's a significant amount of water flow. But we see that even about 30 minutes or another 20 minutes of water flow, there's still smoke and gas release. Um, 42 minutes after the event, there was uh, a deflagration. The water flow was uh, discontinued at about an hour after the event. And after the water flow was discontinued, thermal runaway uh, continued. So in this test here, still gas production, still deflagration. So in each of the tests, what they were able to prove was that the deflagration venting successfully vented the overpressure and flames were emitted from those vents, but each of the compartments filled to approximately 40 to 60% of battery gas at elevated temperatures. The gas accumulation was not prevented by clean agent or water suppression. So that really highlights the gap that we wanted to address um, with our solution. The industry is moving towards more modular designs because these can be listed to the UL 9540 and then for large systems, they just multiply them. But again, some of the cons are that there's a lot less free air space inside. So if you do have a, a thermal runaway, um, you know, you do need to manage those gases. So we came up with a technology that we're calling IntelliVent. This is a example of a cabinet, again, accessed from the outside. And in the event of a catastrophic failure, 
some type of sensor inside. It could be smoke, heat, or gas would tie into a fire alarm panel. That fire alarm panel ties into the IntelliVent system, which opens all of the doors at a very early stage. So this is a, obviously this is a very simple approach, but we feel that it's essential uh, for cabinet-based ESS. Opening the doors allows a dilution uh, solution for the gases. It's um, applicable to a wide variety of enclosure designs. It really relies on a large ratio of door opening to interior volume. Um, so even with a shipping container design, if you have access on the sides, uh, this system would work for it. It, it. We recommend using a smoke detector because that's a very early sensor. It is a fail safe system, which means that if you lose power, all of the doors will open. So it does require a battery backup. Each of the doors can be opened individually, manually for maintenance. And there is a door position sensor that can detect if there's an unintentional opening or um, an activation of the system. It's designed to open automatically. However, there is still an option for a manual activation. In those instances where a technician or the fire department arrives, and if the doors aren't open, they can open the doors just to see what's happening inside from a distance. And that's really the key that we feel for the fire service is it provides a level of situational awareness where you can actually see what's happening. <clears throat> and it, it is a very flexible design. It can reply, it can respond to a, a variety of inputs and is at probably the most significantly, it's retrofitable for a cabinet design. So um, I tried to save a little bit of time, but again, I wanted to thank our sponsor, which is uh, the Office of Electricity and Dr. Imre Zhuk, who we'll hear from at the end here. Um, but uh, I will go ahead and stop my slides and I appreciate um, the opportunity to share this information. Thank you. Yes, Matthew, thank you very much. Really great uh, stuff and uh, work that you presented. And we have some questions uh, and I would like to, to to ask you whether you are able to question them. So one of the questions is, uh, uh, how should we handle uh, the water runoff? Uh, where should it, how should it be handled in case of uh, hosing those uh, enormous amounts of water on the, in fire uh, energy storage systems? Do you have a clue on that? Yeah, great question. So the first decision point is um, your exposures. Uh, remember th this asset, this equipment, um, by the time you get there, if you are seeing active smoke or fire, it is destroyed equipment. Um, so it's not worth risking your life. So the decision point of a defensive operation to protect exposures uh, would help determine that. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a, obviously a case by case and site by site uh, decision, but I, I, I would recommend that that decision of defensive uh, operations. Okay, another question, uh, Matthew. Uh, is a deflagration panel applied mandatory based on the existing standards? So NFPA uh, 855 and International Fire Code, which are adopted in the US, require one of two, either a deflagration panel, deflagration venting, or deflagration prevention, which is a uh, an exhaust type system. Because that's so much more difficult to size for the rate and the volume of gases that come out, most people are just putting in the deflagration venting. Um, but that is also based on an assumption of how many cells will go into thermal runaway, and it's uh, not an exact science. All right. And the, and the final question, that, which came up to my mind when I uh, saw your slides, in one of your slides, you showed that uh, some of the debris uh, was rocketed over 22 meters. Are there in the, in the guidelines in your country, are there uh, thresholds for the amount of debris and the distance the debris may travel as a result of an explosion? Great question. In the current published codes, no. In 855, uh, it's currently being revised for the next edition, and we are including the term cabinets in there because that was not included. And as part of the explosion protection for cabinets, there is language that states that um, uh, none of the cabinet uh, equipment shall become um, projectiles or dislodged in the event of an explosion. Great, thank you very much. And uh, 
Uh, once again, uh, Otho, a great uh, thank you for uh, cooperating with us to, to, to organize this, uh, this conference. Uh, to all the attendees, we are still over 100 of uh, attendees uh, this afternoon in the Netherlands. Uh, we have a brief uh, uh, a break. Uh, I propose we, we take about uh, to a quad, uh, to 10 minutes to uh, past four, so we have a five minutes break. And then we'll come back with two other presentations regarding an incident and the way this incident was handled first by uh, the firefighters and, uh, and secondly in the, in the second presentation by the uh, assurance company. So uh, hopefully I will, uh, I will meet you in, in five minutes for, uh, for a short break and then we'll uh, continue with the final part of this uh, conference. So uh, happy to, uh, to see you in five minutes. Yes, we are at the final stage of, uh, of this afternoon uh, conference and we have two additional uh, incidents and lessons learned uh, to go and then we have uh, time for some closing statements and the first presentation is from Norway from uh, Hans Petter Nielsen and we are really happy that he is uh, willing to share his lessons that he learned from an uh, fire at the energy storage systems in I read the the, the object, the MF Jutterjungen. Hans Petter Nielsen, will you introduce us to the lessons learned from Norway from this incident and where you as a firefighter uh, were able to observe the fire activities and the way they uh, suppress the fire and maybe have some guidelines for us in the Netherlands or all over the world for emergency responders, how to deal with those kind of fires in energy storage systems. Yes, well, thank you, Nels. Um, well, uh, my name is uh, Hans Pata, as we said, and I'm an uh, incident commander in, in the Bergen Fire Brigade in, uh, in uh, the west coast of Norway. So um, I'll do a presentation of, um, of the um, incident. Uh, do you see? Uh, we see your presentation. Yes. You see my presentation, that's good. Uh, well, the, as I said, I'm a, I'm a, a fireman, so I'm not uh, heavy in the uh, battery industry. I've learned a lot after this uh, incident. So this is uh, from my point of view as an as a incident commander. Um, I'll just get it right here. You see it, but I didn't see it as I wanted. I see still your first slide, uh, Hans Petter. OK. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. So uh, yes. in Norway, they're, they're really pushing hard on, uh, on uh, getting uh, the transport industry into using batteries. So. Uh, uh, we passed the number of six, I think they're up to 70, 80 uh, ferries just here on the, on the west coast uh, uh, operating in batteries. And there is also an uh, introduction of large battery packs in, uh, in uh, the oil, oil industry, the military, and, uh, and uh, Bergen is uh, the first city in the world with more than 20% electric cars. So it's um, it's a big issue for the, the for the fire department to, to deal with this. The car haven't um, cars haven't made any pro problem for us, but uh, the incident on the ferry really you know, was a kind of eye opener. So um, this uh, ferry was a small ferry built in 2006. It was uh, originally a diesel engine ferry and uh, it was rebuilt to be electric in uh, 2019. Um, I was not the incident commander at the scene, but I was uh, from the operation center central in, uh, in Bergen. Um, so I said this uh, was an eye opener for us and also we had a, after this incident we had a um, workshop in, in Bergen with the authorities, um, battery industry, 
ship owners and a lot, and we all learn a lot of it from this incident. So I'll try to try to talk with you through the, the incident. Um, and uh, the battery industry had really done a lot to prevent fires, and I have a lot of uh, rules and uh, a lot of testing. But uh, it's for me, it seems a bit like there's been a lot of focus on the barriers, but not if the barriers fails. So what if uh, if you have a if you have a thermal runner, what will happen uh, on board a ship? So if I go back one picture, I'll show you an example of that. Do you still see the same picture? We see the picture, Hans better, but... The ferry? Yes. Ah, okay. Um, well, the first, the, the other picture I showed you, you saw a big ship uh, with, uh, it was the newest ship to the uh, passenger ship here in Norway. And it was uh, with big battery packs and uh, as we have learned earlier today, that it's all about ventilation. And so the, in these battery rooms, they have big exhaust system to get the toxic and flammable gases out of the ship. And on that uh, that big ship, they put the uh, exhaust pipe for this uh, just under the muster station, where all the lifeboats are. So it seems that the designers doesn't have a clue on what this is, and uh, so it's uh, it's uh, it, it, it seems that uh, there are a lot of rules and different, but they, but they have to talk together. All these different people are going to make the ship. So on board the uh, training and did you get the next picture? Or for me, it's, uh, the picture is frozen here. If you want, I can take over the presentation here. Yeah, yeah so uh, uh, what I want to show now is the battery room where the service work is finished. Is that the picture you have? No, we still have the battery. I will uh, host the presentation from our side. If you uh, uh, g for continue with your story and call on me when you want to see the next slide. Okay, so if you go to the service work finished at 70, 1700 hours. Yeah, so this uh, battery pack uh, is uh, 2 megawatts and uh, the workers have been doing service uh, on the cooling system on board. And uh, the cooling system is 30% cool and 70% water. And the BMS, the, the battery managed system, was turned off because of uh, the maintenance. Um, so if you go to the next slide, the fire discovered. Yes. Yes, the ferry uh, is uh, on the way over and uh, it's in a remote area, so the, they discovered a fire, but from the um, normal fire system on board the ship. So they didn't get any warning from the BMS because that was turned off. Uh, there was uh, three crew, crew members on board, and uh, and uh, they um, they um, want to uh, evacuate the people first. That's what they're trying to do, and they also releases the fire extinguisher system, which is in the battery room salt water. So also here is another, as firemen we know that salt water on batteries is probably not a very good idea. So the provider of the uh, system afterwards says that uh, this increased uh, the development of the fire. Uh, and they also released the uh, Novak uh, 1230 fire extinguishing system. Uh, which uh, doesn't help for uh, when you have a, th a thermal runaway. But that's what the crew has learned to do, and uh, that's what they did. So if we go to the next picture then. Yes. Yes, yeah, so when the uh, local fire department uh, show what they see in the, uh, 
they uh, observe a lot of smoke with no open flames from the ship at the arrival. Um, the crew meet uh, the fire department by safety plan and they also tell them that uh, it's not the batteries that are burning, but it's uh, uh, some um, cables on the surrounding areas. So the local fire brigade puts, um, puts uh, some amount of cuffs down uh, a com compressed air foam system uh, down the hatch from the deck. Uh, it's an emergency exit from the battery room. So they put some uh, cuffs uh, down there and then they close the hatch and, uh, and uh, then this, uh, the fire central in Bergen. This is a remote uh, area. So this is uh, the fire, fire brigade here is uh, people who have uh, different jobs and show up when uh, there are incidents. So the the spot now the um, alarm central in Bergen informs of, about the dangers of uh, hydrofluoric uh, acid and uh, tell them to be careful. Though. So they send uh, some um, some smoke divers, as we call them in, uh, in Scandinavia, so uh, with breed, breeding apparatus, into the down into the ship to see if there any smoke spread uh, away from the battery room. So they go to the board room or the switchboard room next to the battery room and they measure the temperature under control of spread. There's no spread and there's uh, 60 degrees uh, Celsius on the door to the battery room. And uh, half an hour later, I have a new, um, a new um, temperature measurement and the temperature has gone down to 30 degrees and there's still no smoke spread. So then you can go to the next uh, picture. Yes. Yes, the incident commander reports fire on control. That's right. That's uh, after several uh, temperature measurements that shows a decreasing temperature and hardly any smoke from the ship. The crew from the ship is uh, sent to the local doctor since they've been um, exposed for the uh, smoke and, and the start of the incident and they asked uh, to come back later. And you can go to the next picture again. Yes. And the smoke then increases again, uh, 2133, and they once again send down the smoke towers to the boardroom and they opened a hydraulic door and a small amount of water is sent into the, to the switch boardroom which you can see uh, in the red, uh, you have the battery room at the top and you have the switchboard room uh, under. The, switch, you know, the room uh, immediately gets uh, filled with smoke and uh, they have to they decide to pull out. It gets uh, uncomfortable and uh, they're not happy with the situation. So then you can go to the next one again. Yes. Yes, the smoke. Uh, decreases and they start to make a plan for the night. The temperature is stable. Uh, the measure point is one on the hatch on the deck and one on the battery room door, door to the battery room, and uh, one on the, um, on the side of the ship from the outside. So um, the plan is for the night is to measure every 15 minutes to watch if there are any change of temperature. So then you can go to the next one again. Yes. So in um, five in the morning, they, uh, everything is quiet and they start to, uh, they found out that they will open the hatch to ventilate. So the temperatures uh, start to rise slowly and the crew is uh, considering to contact the alarm central, but uh, or to get some advice, but uh, they are waiting to get 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 uh, one more measurement done. So now we can go to the next one. Yes. So now uh, at um, uh, seven uh, now in just before seven in the morning, the, there's a, a quite powerful explosion. Uh, and you can see the fire truck is uh, about uh, 50 meters away from the hatch where, uh, where, where they've been working. 
and the tail lights on the, on the fire truck is uh, damaged and there's a lot of damage on the ferry. So at that time they just uh, drive away and they um, make a, a safety zone for 300 meters and uh, ask for help. So uh, at that time I was, well, we just came to work and I heard them on, on the radio. So we immediately sent the sent uh, some help for them and then we can go to the next picture. Yes. What we uh, we did there was we sent a, a mix of um, ship uh, ship experts and uh, a hazmat team. So um, and uh, with a drone, so we could. Uh, we could uh, help the local fire department to make some measurements if there were any hydrochloric uh, acid and also help them to normalize the situation. We also had a, the drone with us so we could film what uh, we're doing and approach it from distance. So now we can go to the next one. Yes. So now the temperature has gone down, there's no signs of fluid acid on deck and uh, and uh, there's no, uh, it's possible to, enter, it's not possible to enter the, the battery room through the normal uh, hydraulic door because it's, uh, it, it's been uh, destroyed. So they have to go down through the hatch on deck. So now we can go to the next picture. Well, there's an infrared camera from, um, from the drone. It should be a film now, but it's probably not because I had to uh, minimize the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, when we go down, uh, you can see one firefighter there watching the other one. Uh, the other one is in a chemical suit and uh, they measure two parts per million uh, just down the hatch and 10 parts per million uh, hydrofluoric acid in the um, battery room and the temperature is 70 degrees. So they do some recordings and go up again. And at this time, there was a lot of uh, experts from the, uh, from the company that uh, installed the batteries and they wanted us to go down again and do some more pictures. Um, the fire was out and uh, they wanted us to give some guarantees and we said, um, the fire is out, it's your ship and uh, you are the expert. So we put the responsibility over, over to them. A couple of minutes, uh, Hans Petter, then come to the conclusion, please. Yes, okay. I'll do some uh, aftermath. That's um, after the incident, uh, so one of the guys from the fire brigade got um, had trouble with the uh, he got signs for fluoric acid poisoning, so he was uh, sent to hospital. And uh, the doctors and the fire chief agreed that all 19 firefighters that had been implicated from the local fire department was hospitalized. And you can see uh, there was some small 10 minutes uh, smoke types, and you can see the hydrofluoric acid had uh, has uh, uh, itched on the on the um, mask glass and on the on the manometer glass it's the same picture you have there i forgot to tell you to move it do you have the picture of the of the mask yes okay so then you can move to the next one that's from the door to the battery room And uh, after the door to the, the battery, which after the explosion is moved away. So if you can move down to the picture when the where you can see the battery with the that has been burned off. As I said, there is an exhaust system that ventilates out all the um, the dangerous gases. But when then when this happened, the flames uh, just went out because of the intense heat. So this is one and a half millimeter steel and it and it shows that this exhaust system doesn't work. Uh, so it filled the, the ship immediately with uh, and the battery room with with uh, the explosive explosive gases. So if you go to the next one, 
Uh, you see, the construction of a ship is always that you have to have um, uh, you have to have drainage to get water. If you get water in, you have to uh, drainage it down to the bottom of the ship and uh, and um, pump it out. So the same thing happens here. You see the battery room and the switchboard room. The smoke went down under the floor and down to the bottom of the ship. So the explosion we could see came from underneath the battery room. But the ignition is probably in the battery room. So it was a better mix of gases down under. Next picture with the, is the batteries. Uh, one week after the explosion, the police had a difficult job. Uh, they had two during the week. They had two times they had to evacuate because the ventilation of the batteries started again two times. So it's uh, difficult. Some thoughts at the end. Suggestion for improvement. So it's more thoughts around it. I think that when you get a, a battery fire on a ship, you can't classify it as a, a, a ship fire. You have to send it's a battery room fire on a ship. It's a, a big difference. You have to send hazmat people who knows what they're dealing with. And coast guards and uh, the one who probably will be the first, they should always contact a, a fire department with husband competence. Thermal runaway, it said earlier today, the explosion is the main danger, and that was a surprise for me. Um, you know, you don't enter the battery room, you tow the ship to a remote key, and uh, you deal, deal with it in a very um, defensive way. And the crew on board have learned afterwards, they don't know anything about this. So you don't get any help from the crew, uh, unfortunately. They should absolutely learn about uh, what they have on board. Because they released a system that they think suppressed the fire, but instead it increased the fire. I'll just have two words on the last picture. There was a new incident, so if you jump one down to the brim. Uh, I, I would suggest we come to the conclusion, uh, Hans Petter, because we are really running out of time. So maybe it's okay. better to, to, to finish. That's an, uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, stop here. So this is an uh, incident uh, a month ago that needs its own presentation. But they sold it by pushing in nitrogen and uh, ventilating out the battery room. So maybe that's hey. the model next time. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Thank you. I'm sorry the presentation went wrong. It so was really testing this in front, so that was maybe can happen. Uh, no problem at all, uh, Hans Peter. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, first view on uh, on the on the ferry uh, fighter uh, related to this energy storage system. As I already uh, told you just before, we are sh briefly running out of time, so. There are some questions in the question and answers uh, chat, so I would uh, uh, suppose Hans Petter, you you look at the at the chat and maybe you are able to answer there the questions, uh, which brings me to the 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 final official uh, presenter, uh, which is an, uh, a specialist from the Netherlands, which is uh, dealing with an incident at the Markavada in the Netherlands and Rocco. Would you like to, to start your presentation and hopefully you're able to, to, to keep it within 50 to 20 minutes? I hope you hear me right now. Yes, no I hear point. you clear. Thank you. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, my name is Rocco van Tichelen. Uh, I work uh, as a last uh, adjuster for uh, insurance companies and uh, we uh, conduct uh, various uh, investigations on uh, every uh, specialist's own skills. Uh, we have a strong international network uh, of uh, VRS adjusters and enables an EMN to uh, offer worldwide uh, uh, incidents uh, and claim handling. Uh, for now, um, uh, I give you an uh, overview of the uh, incident on the Mark of Wadden. Uh, the Markovaden is a, a man-made remote island. Uh, as you can see, uh, this was taken on a, on a boat trip. Uh, you have to uh, uh, take a boat for about 30 to 45 minutes before you uh, come here. And it's uh, completely self-sustaining. Um, 
the picture you see here uh, is uh, this small part of the, the uh, island uh, where the fire has been. Um, the Marco uh, uh, is equipped with uh, with solar panels and, and a windmill uh, to uh, storage uh, all of the electric energy uh, that is uh, produced uh, by the solar panels. As you can see, um, almost every building is equipped with solar panels. Um, and the red square is uh, the location where the building was, where the, uh, the energy was stored. There was located an uh, ESS of uh, 160 kilowatt hours. Um, because it was a remote island, they don't have a fire, de uh, fire department uh, around the corner, so it took about uh, 30, 45 minutes. So this is a photo taken uh, of the building where the ESS was stored, was located. Uh, where you can see the, the smoke on the left side of the building, that's uh, the location of the uh, ESS storage, uh, with, together with uh, other equipment uh, to provide uh, self-sustaining, self such as uh, warm water, uh, filtering water, uh, and of course, uh, storage of electricity. Um, Naturally, when I arrived, uh, when, when the fire is extinguished and uh, the fire was uh, quite destructive. As you can see, the, the left of the right side of the building is completely gone. The left side of the building, that was the steel construction that was still standing. Uh, on the left side, there was the, the ESS located. And um, the little red square uh, is the, the position where the uh, uh, ESS was located. The ESS uh, was approximately uh, 80 centimeters deep, about 2 meter 50 uh, long and about uh, to 1 meter 80 high and two doors. Uh, enough ventilation and uh, fully equipped what you can see is that uh, we found strange that we had some uh, coils, some wiring, uh, but we did not find many batteries, uh, lithium batteries, because we were uh, uh, told uh, before we were arrived on the, on the scene that it was uh, energy storage with lithium uh, uh, cells. And yeah, lithium cells, uh, uh, normally uh, you will find all over the place. And that wasn't the case in this uh, incident. Uh, what you can see is, um, yeah, almost uh, uh, the remains of the of the cabinet that was took out of the uh, by the fire department, and um, all the batteries were uh, uh, transported into a container and filled with water. The container was set on its side. Um, what we uh, did was uh, we uh, reconstructed uh, the cabinet where the ESS uh, was uh, located. Oh, this is uh, the, the uh, battery that we found. Um, I told you we were uh, expecting lithium batteries, but we found life uh, po batteries, which has an uh, other uh, cell structure and other construction of, of, uh, uh, of batteries. Um, I had not uh, uh, had investigated the fire with lifeboat batteries, so it was quite remarkable what we found uh, over there. Um, the fire department took all the things out. We reconstructed the, the metal frame where the, the uh, batteries were uh, stored. And uh, finally, we uh, came to one almost complete cabinet uh, without the front doors. Um, we found uh, a lot of uh, uh, melted and, and shortcut uh, uh, burned wires um, that were hardened and, and uh, left arcing on, on the back plate of the, uh, of the cabinet. And the back plate, you can see the, the uh, red ellipses on the back that shows that uh, that's where the, the uh, steel plating was uh, penetrated. 
and the penetration of the steel uh, was uh, caused by uh, uh, arcing from, from cables. This meant uh, for us that uh, there was power on the cable uh, from the site itself or from the batteries itself that we did not uh, uh, find that out because uh, the solar panels uh, were uh, connected through the system uh, to an inverter and um, the communication between those units were not uh, 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 well tested before. This was the second time they uh, started up this uh, uh, energy uh, source uh, for storage and that's when it went wrong. What we did find was um, that it was an electrical cause and um, because every uh, battery system is equipped with, with a battery management system, um, we checked it with the manufacturer of the cabinet and um, the cells you can see on the on the right here um, has a battery management system board on top of the battery. Usually the BMS, the battery management system, will shut down the battery when uh, there uh, is a failure or uh, they uh, receive a command to, to shut down. Um, so the batteries that were used in the ESS were LiPo batteries and um, the LiPo batteries, um, um, uh, when they ca catch fire, they will melt. It, it, it's a, 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 a plastic uh, housing and it will melt down and it will lose his energy. Um, that consults for us that there is less spread of fire and for uh, the insurance companies, but also for uh, fire uh, departments, it's uh, a type of battery that uh, has less uh, fire spread uh, area. So it's much smaller uh, and the chance that it will ignite an uh, other fire uh, from exploding or shooting away batteries is quite big with lithium batteries. That is what we did not find in this uh, incident, in this specific incident. During the investigation, we uh, uh, did not conclude uh, uh, the, the exact uh, uh, cause of the uh, shortcutting uh, that we have seen. Um, possible causes are arcing from the cables, uh, programming flaws because uh, the, the communication was not well tested, uh, but also uh, installation flaws uh, could be uh, a, a cause uh, of igniting this, this fire. As I um, already said, the fire spread was uh, a lot smaller um, and that was uh, quite interesting on this fire. When uh, uh, you remove the lithium batteries to uh, uh, do it in a container with water um, and LiPo batteries, uh, it's, we don't, do not see it necessary to remove it uh, otherwise than uh, uh, containing it and do not touch it because it could have uh, some energy left. Um, to conclude for my uh, uh, um, other investigations we uh, committed in the last few years, um, the most common uh, uh, problems with uh, batteries and battery installations in, in cars, in, in, in bicycles, in um, or um, uh, custom made systems are uh, usually in, in um, installation flaws, uh, box and programming, a communication between different uh, uh, systems. Um, and in solar systems, it's, it's uh, uh, common for the MC4 connectors, uh, especially. Also, uh, lithium batteries and, and uh, LiPo batteries uh, should have good ventilation and cooling when using lithium batteries, uh, especially. Um, the LiPo batteries can have uh, a lot more uh, 
heat from uh, outside and lithium cannot have that. Um, I'm not uh, uh, promoting a, 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 this battery system especially, but it, it, it gives uh, a lot less uh, fire spread. Um, so this is a, a short version of, of uh, uh, the safety issues that we saw uh, and the fire spread that we saw um, on the incidents. And um, yeah, for us, the, the most common causes are installation of and not the batteries itself. The batteries uh, uh, are usually ignited by uh, external uh, causes, uh, by bad installation or by programming or a flaw in programming or whatever. So there's a, that's yeah. Finally, uh, conclusion of of uh, safety issues. What we have seen that could be uh, prevented by uh, law or regulation for. Uh, uh, not only the battery makers, but also the guys who install it. Uh, they have to be uh, certified to do it. And that's still a problem in the Netherlands for some systems, especially when you go to low voltage. Um, so far, um, the highlights, less fire spread, risk in fire with life power batteries uh, is less. Uh, and the cause of most incidents are found in unum installation of design flaws. Uh, so, Niels, I hope I gave you uh, all a, a good review of uh, what we have seen in the market about it. And maybe there are questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Rocco. Thank, uh, thank you very much for uh, for introducing us in the uh, Markovada fire. Uh, there are no questions, but. In my mind, uh, and I hear you also giving a short, let's say, brief answer to the solution for uh, the failures or the causes that you uh, investigated of those fires. And you said the, shoot, uh, the causes were installation, software, and communication uh, flaws in installing energy storage systems that you you were hinting for uh, harsh regulations for installers uh, to uh, to prevent for those causes. Uh, do you think uh, our regulations today are not harsh or string stringent enough, or what is it? What is missing in your opinion? Uh, for instance, when you look at uh, our neighbor Germany, uh, when you look at solar systems, they have special regulations for uh, cabling. Uh, they have to be fire retardant. They have to be uh, special uh, uh, certified to install uh, solar systems. Um, and they go further with the MC4 connectors uh, that are not compatible with each other. Please make it compatible that there's no uh, confusion in, in the market and uh, make regulations for installers that they can uh, re rely on. And uh, they've done that in, in Germany mostly. All right. Yeah, th thank you, Rocco. And with, well. with this recommendation from you, looking over the borders of the Netherlands, looking to Germany, we, we, we say we should look over the, the borders of also our European continent and we go back to uh, the United States where uh, Matthew Pace and Tom Hessels and Sander Lepela got the initiative to organize this pan-European uh, US-American European conference on the safety of energy storage systems and one of the, the founders of uh, let's say energy safety storage and the safety aspects uh, of those storage systems is uh, Dr. Imre Gurik. He is the director of the energy storage of the Department of Energy, and he is the expert in the safety of energy storage systems. And we are really, really happy to have him here because he is one of the founders of the whole program that is uh, being uh, elaborated on in the United States in order to get a clear view on the safety mechanisms of energy storage systems. He uh, has earned a lot of uh, prizes and awards, and I would like to give the word to Dr. Imre Gewick to, let's say, give his reflection 
on this afternoon. And maybe, uh, Dr. Kierig, you have also some clues for the future, how to, let's say, to make progress in the safety of energy storage systems as you see uh, these systems coming up to our, in, to our societies. Well, Goedendag. I'm uh, Imre Duk, and I direct the energy storage uh, program at the Department of Energy in the United States. And uh, I'm not, not so much an expert on safety as I am an expert on energy storage in general. It's been a great, real pleasure to take part in this EU Energy Storage System Safety Conference uh, together with my uh, colleague uh, Matt Pace. And what has been enjoyable is the focus on the reality of actually dealing with fires and explosive events uh, on batteries. Uh, we have had many firemen, former firemen, in uh, th these presentations and it has given an air of reality. Going back a little bit, in 2012, uh, there was a 15 megawatt lead acid based storage facility in Hawaii, which burned to the ground. It was backing up 30 megawatts of wind. And I was worried that this was the end of storage technology. Uh, I was afraid that this would close the chapter and storage would not be deployed. Of course, that didn't happen because today we are expecting some $7.3 billion uh, dollars, uh, by 2025. And as you've heard earlier today, energy storage is a fundamental part of the Energiewende. Up until then, price had, be, had been the main consideration in developing new storage technology. This event changed things. So in 2014, we convened the first safety workshop. It was clear that we would need diverse communities of participants, and Sean and others have pointed this out already. We need scientists, firemen, insurance people, building inspectors, risk assessors, and uh, many others. But from then on, it became safety first. And by that we mean validated safety. We also needed codes and standards, not only for uh, lead acid batteries, but for all kinds of batteries. Because meanwhile, there had been fires on sodium sulfur batteries and uh, a good number of them on lithium ion batteries. So we developed a roadmap for battery safety research and we established a program of research on energy storage. And the components of this program, uh, there are four main components. Uh, one is safety and abuse testing, uh, basically testing to destruction. Uh, questions like what are the local cell failures that lead to propagation eventually? Uh, also questions of mitigation, active cooling and separation. Rising out of these experiments comes modeling and thermal analysis. And that represented a multi-scale approach, starting with the anode cathode and taking a single cell failure mode to build system models. We wanted to predict system behavior, at least statistically. Things like total flammable gas production. The third one is long-term reliability reliability and degradation, understanding performance boundaries uh, for batteries. Is 80% uh, performance really the end of life? Uh, or 
is the boundary much bigger? Uh, the the 80% uh, boundary was essentially an ad hoc that was thought up in terms of EV batteries, but not necessarily so. But then again, do batteries become unsafe with age? And for, number four was codes, standards, and outreach. And we started a safety collaborative, which turns out a quart quarterly newsletter and uh, appraises the members of the development of new standards and what the status of codes are at any particular time. Uh, we also do a good number of tutorials and training courses, and we do safety checks on particular installations. At the moment, we are rewriting the energy storage roadmap, which was developed a while ago, and many new insights have been developed since then. So I was very pleased to see this uh, first uh, safety conference, this first European safety conference, and as I said, uh, I was glad we could help in bringing it about. I particularly uh, enjoyed the case histories. Uh, case histories are very important because uh, often the observers of events are not trained uh, and the important features get lost. Also over time, generally the uh, narrative becomes uh, muddied and unclear. And so to have a good timeline for a case history is really important. Uh, such as the one on the Bergen fer Ferry and the McMicken uh, facility, uh, but also the Birmingham installation. Um, I think you are well set up to have uh, a healthy establishment on safety research and uh, safety practice. And the only thing that I would like to add to this is uh, a plea for consistent product and installation standards. Try to make them uh, consistent uh, over individual states and then over the entire European Union and the international community. Uh, and with that, I thank you for a splendid conference and uh, I will see you next year. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Dr. Gug, uh, Dr. thank you very much for these uh, uh, great words, great words from, uh, let's say, your the program that you are running, the the, the four pilots that you uh, elaborated on, and also thank you very much for your your final recommendation because, as we know, those battery energy storage systems they are produced all over the world, they travel all over the world. They might have also the same kind of incident causes all, all over the world, so standardization in terms of codes and testing uh, testing schemes are really really important and i think we uh, we should join forces to to come to those kind of let's say internationally accepted codes for testing the safety of those uh, battery energy uh, storage systems and maybe in the future also for all kind of other energy storage systems like hydrogen like ammonia uh, like uh, solid state batteries. So thank you very much, very much for your uh, kind words and your 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 recommendation for the future, uh, which brings us, which brings me to uh, to the end of this uh, this afternoon. It was really a great pleasure to host you, and hosting you was not possible without the help from many others. I already mentioned Matthew Pace. I already mentioned Tom Hessels and also uh, Sander Lepelaar from the Zeeuwse region uh, Haaglanden, who unfortunately could not join. And 
who I did not mention here, but she's really uh, busy behind the scenes, is uh, Monique Bicker. <laughs> she's laughing out loud uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the, the room which we sit in. But I would like to join you for first of all joining, for second of all posing your question, and thirdly for bringing up some ideas for the next, for the near future. And what I hope to do, and uh, I hope uh, Matthew you will join me, is uh, to organize a real life conference at the end of uh, 2021, in which we may present, let's say, the progress that we make in Europe, the things that you are doing in the United States and maybe some other countries and continents as well to join and to, to make really work of exchanging the knowledge, science-based, because that is, I think, in my opinion, a really important feature of sharing knowledge. It should be validated, it should be science-based, and in case it is not science-based, it's also really important to have the narratives, the, the, the cases which we were introduced uh, this afternoon, and hopefully uh, you all are willing to, to join at the end of this year in a real live event uh, in which we make progress on uh, the energy storage systems and, uh, and the safety aspects of them. So to, to conclude, thank you very much. We are happy you joined and hopefully we see each other in a couple of months in real life dealing with the safety aspects of uh, energy storage systems. Thank you very much for joining.